written behind closed doors that numbers thousands of pages without the time to review or amend it before a vote. Today's hearing builds on the work we've done to demand change and move forward single subject appropriations bills. With H.R. 5994, the Labor, Health, and Human Services, Education, and Related Agencies Appropriations Act, we continue to make the hard choices to put our nation on a better path forward. The bill directs the valuable taxpayer dollars where they can best impact constituents. It prioritizes research for novel medicines that can save and transform lives. It invests in the well-being and education of the most precious among us, our nation's children. And it supports telehealth in our rural communities, the sanctity of life, and America's fight against addiction. I'm confident we'll hear more on these important priorities from our witnesses today. I'll note uh, it's not the only task ahead of us. I made clear our fiscal challenges above, uh, and I, we've made significant progress on our 12 appropriations bills thus far, but the job is certainly not yet done. As we scrutinize every expenditure, our country faces an expiration of federal funding on November 17. Uh, it's clear that no, uh, no matter what strides have been made to change the way we do business, additional time is needed to complete our work for fiscal year 2024. It's why the House will take up the Further Continuing Appropriations and Other Extensions Act, which extends federal funding for four appropriations titles through January 19th of 2024, and the remaining eight titles through February 2nd of 2024. Extending funding uh, in this way will give the House and Senate additional time and incentive to negotiate full-year spending bills for each title individually, rather than one massive take-it-or-leave-it omnibus right before the holidays. Extending the previous year's funding is never an ideal way to govern, but the alternative is even worse. We owe it to our constituents to keep the government open and operating to continue to provide them with the services they need and deserve. This bill will accomplish that goal and will ensure that Congress has sufficient time to reach agreement on final appropriations bills covering the rest of fiscal 2024. I'll now yield uh, to my very good friend, our ranking member, Mr. McGovern, for any remarks he wishes to make. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's good to see you. Uh, you know, in the last two weeks, both the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development and the Financial Services Appropriation Bills were pulled from the floor because Republicans didn't have the votes. The Agriculture Bill failed floor passage and is uh, considered all but dead. In fact, all five of the GOP's remaining appropriation bills have major issues. The ones we're considering this week have never been marked up in committee, and I hear it's likely that they too may fail. I don't call that regular order. I call that regular disorder. Uh, the way this place is being run is so far beyond incompetent. My Republican friends are trying to convince us to pass bills that they can't even convince themselves to pass. I mean, forget about bipartisan. These bills aren't even partisan. They're hyperpartisan. They're so awful they can't even get their own members to agree. Let's look first at H.R. 5894, the Labor, Health, and Human Services Education and Related Agencies Appropriation Act. It is a disaster. It, is, it drastically underfunds public schools and slashes teachers' jobs. It stifles life-saving medical research and cuts programs that support maternal and child uh, health. Of course, like all their other appropriation bills, it contains a litany of MAGA culture war anti-abortion riders. Let me give the other side a little free advice. I don't know how many times I have to say it, the American people want you to stop trying to tell women what they can do, what they can do with their bodies. At the ballot box in Congress and state legislatures, they just want you to stop. Pay attention to last week's elections in Ohio. Pay attention to every single time in every single state where abortion has been on the ballot. And not just in blue states, I'm talking about Kentucky, Kansas, Montana, every single time Americans have said they want these decisions to be between women and their doctors, not women and Republican politicians. Yet here we are with another MAGA messaging bill that strips away abortion rights from women. It's just nuts. And Democrats, once again, will continue to stand up to these Republican attempts to ban abortion nationwide. We are also here today to consider House Republicans' CR, a last-minute Hail Mary 
the new speaker threw together because he too has realized that the other plan to jam through each unpopular appropriations bill one at a time won't work. This CR creates a bizarre bifurcated approach setting up two separate CR deadlines that will only make a future shutdown more likely. To be clear, they aren't kicking one can down the road, you're kicking two cans. And while we are, are talking about numbers, remember, we wasted three weeks without a speaker while extreme MAGA Republicans fought with regular MAGA Republicans about who should be speaker. Then more, then more weeks wasted trying and, trying and failing to ram the remaining spending bills through the House, bills that will never, ever, ever become law. And the truth is, we are right back where we started at the end of September because Republicans cannot govern. They have made clear that in a divided government, they will refuse to work with anyone outside their conference. Same circus, new ringmaster. And this CR is just a perfect, a perfect example of that. It fails to include critical supplemental help for our allies abroad, like Israel and Ukraine, or direly needed humanitarian assistance, provisions widely supported in the Senate and by the White House. Most egregious in my mind is there's no additional funding for WIC in this CR to help ensure that we can feed hungry mothers, children, and infants. This bill shortchanges the program, and we need to make the program whole as soon as possible to avoid wait lists for benefits. Everybody up here has people in their district who rely on this basic nutrition program. Pregnant mothers, so they can deliver healthy children. Young kids who don't know where their next meal will come from. Babies. I can't imagine why it would be controversial to make sure WIC has proper funding. We need to make this commitment, we, we need to make this commitment to, to pregnant and postpartum moms and their young families. And we, need, we need to make this commitment right now. So I hope that by some miracle, we don't shut down. But the truth is, House Republicans just aren't capable of governing. They are a minority party pretending to be a majority party, full of people who want to scream and yell and complain, but not actually get anything done. I think half the GOP would rather be in the minority so they can go back to voting no on everything and keep complaining and complaining about how broken this place is when they're the ones who broke it. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. But before I do, uh, uh, my good friend from Texas, the vice chairman of this committee, and I were elected together in the same class. And he's uh, been my friend and colleague from the very first day that I was uh, fortunate enough to come to this institution. I can't think of a finer person, uh, a better member, a person who's been consistently uh, working hard to advance the right principles, the right values, and frankly, who's always conducted himself uh, in a matter that uh, brings great credit to this institution, uh, to the people of his district, and certainly to the people of the great state of Texas. And Mike, we're going to squeeze every drop out of you in the next 13 months. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, you, you need have no doubt. But uh, I just want to tell you how much I'm going to miss you as a friend and a colleague when that time comes that you leave. I'm glad it's not in the immediate future. And I just want to thank you for the contributions you've made uh, and the manner in which you've conducted yourself throughout almost uh, 22 years of distinguished service to this institution. So, my friend, um, we don't miss you yet, but we're going to uh, miss you a lot. And uh, just thanks again for being who you are, and thank you for conducting yourself in the manner in which you do, uh, which, frankly, uh, members on both sides of the aisle would do well to emulate 
and who I and that I know members on both sides of the aisle appreciate and value. That I turn to my friend for any remarks he cares to make. To well, thank you. Them. And I, let me just say to Dr. Burgess, um, I'm going to miss you. I think we're all going to miss you. I can't believe I'm saying that. Um, <laughs> but maybe after... It's on the record but, now. But, but, as, but, as, but as you pointed out, you're still here for a whole other year, so maybe by the end of that time, I may have changed my tune. Um, <laughs> but the bottom line is, um, you know, we have lots of dis disagreements on issues, but there have been occasions where we have actually come together um, and work together to get some stuff done, and I really appreciate uh, those moments. Um, I always tell people you don't have to agree on everything to agree on something, uh, and if something you agree on, you got to work together to get it done. And, and you have been willing to to work with me on issues, and I've been willing to work with you on issues. Uh, but um, but uh, look, um, uh, this committee won't be the same without you. Uh, and uh, and again, I uh, we still have a year to go, uh, and so there'll be lots of debate, uh, and hopefully. There'll be opportunities for more agreement, but uh, but I, I thank you for your service, uh, not only to this committee, to this Congress, uh, but to this country. And uh, with that, I yield back. Well, I thank gentlemen very much. Um, without objection, any prepared statements that our witnesses may have will be included in the record. I'd like to welcome our first panel, Chairman Robert Adderholt, Ranking Member Rosa Delore from the Committee on Appropriations Subcommittee on Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education. Chairman Adderholt, I welcome your testimony. Thank you, uh, Chairman Cole, and good to be with you, and uh, Ranking Member McGovern, thank you, uh, and all members of the committee. And to uh, Dr. Burgess, we're uh, certainly uh, going to miss you, as the, as the Chairman mentioned, but uh, congratulations on your retirement, um, I guess, uh, year after next. So uh, we uh, wish you the best but look forward to working with you in the meantime. Uh, I'm honored to come before this committee uh, today to present FY uh, 2024 Labor, Health, and Human Services Education and Related Agencies Bill to you and ask for a rule for its consideration on the House floor. Uh, this is my first year to uh, chair this important subcommittee, and of course, uh, I'd be remiss not to mention that uh, Chairman of this uh, committee were before now, was chairman and uh, ranking member for many years of this subcommittee, so he knows this probably uh, more than anybody in the room, but I'm proud to be able to support so many of the programs and it's touched so many lives of every American. Uh, our nation remains mired in high inflation, uh, which has only been worsened by the massive infusion of government spending, both during and immediately after the COVID pandemic. I have said many times and that uh, inflation is a tax on every American. Moreover, it is a tax that's borne disproportionately by low-income low Americans. We cannot continue to make our constituents pay for our reckless D.C. Beltway spending. At some point, we must stop the out-of-control spending spree that we've done over the last several years. This bill represents a clear first step toward returning to fiscal responsibility while ensuring that funding for critical and high priority functions are maintained. Yes, the bill before us today reflects the challenges in achieving deficit reduction solely through reductions in discretionary spending. A $60 billion cut to social spending programs in this bill requires scrutiny and priority setting. Over 50 programs are proposed for reductions and then another 60 programs are eliminated, and most of those are either unauthorized or they have uh, expired authorizations. Title I grants to states are cut by nearly 80 percent, or more than $14 billion. While Title I grants do support school districts everywhere, including the rural districts like mine that I represent, these funds disproportionately support big city public schools the same public schools that failed to educate the most vulnerable children that was entrusted to them by closing their doors for almost two years. It is estimated that over $20 billion in unspent funding still remains available from funds provided during the pandemic for, to these schools. Until this funding is drawn down and it is used responsibly, the federal government should not continue to make further investments in failing schools. At the same time, this bill prioritizes biodefense, programs that support rural America, target education programs, including those for children with special needs, 
and congressional oversight responsibility. The bill maintains support for Pell Grants and the language uh, to ensure borrowers can quickly resume payments on their uh, student loan following the recent Supreme Court decision. Other programs for, cert for certain vulnerable populations, such as Americans with disabilities, older Americans, and foster children are maintained at current levels. Child care block grants, which provide vouchers for families to choose the child care setting of their choice, are main is maintained at $8 billion. In response to the executive branch overreach to this administration, in this, of this administration, the bill prohibits funding for programs that are focused solely on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and it eliminates funding for Planned Parenthood and other controversial grantees. It protects religious freedom and values by stopping the administration's regulation that would require schools to allow biological boys to compete against girls in women's sports programs, and it prohibits any federal funding from going toward enforcing gender identity politics or social, hormonal, or surgical interventions to look like the opposite sex. The bill prohibits funding for controversial ideologies like critical race theory. These radical views do not belong in the public schools. Schools should be teaching our children how to think, not what to think. The bill maintains the longstanding Hyde Amendment to ensure that taxpayer funds are not used for abortion on demand and that no one is forced to participate in an abortion or refer to one under federal programs. The bill also makes sure that taxpayer funds are not used to circumvent state laws restricting access to abortion and ensures that federal re research funds are not used on human fetal tissue obtained from an elective abortion. The bill that is before us also includes provisions preventing this administration from moving forward with job killing regulations relating to independent contractors, joint employer status, and federally forced wage rates for agricultural workers. The administration's regulatory agenda is stifling small business, which should be incubators for innovation. To protect against future man-made pandemics, the bill prohibits any funding from going to Echo Health Alliance, the Wuhan Institute for Virology, and any lab located in Russia or in China. The bill prohibits funding from being used for any gain-of-function research, as was being done on bat, uh, on, on bat uh, coronavirus prior to the uh, COVID pandemic, and it prohibits enforcement of the CMS COVID vaccine mandate on healthcare workers. In closing, of course, in addition to thanking the uh, chair of this uh, 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 Appropriations Committee, uh, Chairman Granger, I want to also thank my fellow subcommittee members and their staff for all their hard work uh, over uh, the last year. Also, a special thanks to the Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education Subcommittee staff who have gone beyond the call of du duty, have done an exceptional job in crafting the bill that's before us today. And I would be happy to take any questions that the panel has as we move forward. Thank you, and I yield back. Thanks. Uh, we'll uh, next go to my good friend, the ranking member of the full Appropriations Committee, as well as the ranking member of the Labor, uh, Health, and Human Services uh, and Education Subcommittee, uh, the gentlelady from uh, Connecticut, Ms. DeLauro. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, what I want to try to do is to address the Labor HHS uh, a, a Subcommittee um, a, a bill, and as well as the continuing resolution. But I'll start with Labor HHS. And I, I want to congratulate Chairman Adderholt, his first bill as chairman of the subcommittee. Um, uh, and uh, I want to say a thank you to the minority staff, to Stephen Stegleiter, Philip Tizani, Laurie Mignon, Jackie Kilroy, uh, for all of their hard work. Uh, and also to the majority staff, Susan Ross, Catherine Salmon, James Redstone, Emily Goff, and Laura Stagno. You've heard me say many times, Mr. Chairman, that um, um, uh, they keep our names on the door. Uh, they really are really first rate, and I thank them very, very much. Um, uh, I have never seen an appropriations bill quite like this one. I have never seen a bill that was this inhumane 
and which defies all of the values and ideals of a society which promises to address the needs and the challenges of its people. In Charles Dickens' Great Expectations, Pip observes the Pocket family uh, and the Pocket family children and as, and I quote, not growing up or being brought up, but tumbling up, end quote. This bill leaves America's children tumbling up. This bill is the largest domestic appropriation bill, and for good reason. The programs funded in labor, health, and human services and education ensure our workforce is strong, our families are healthy and safe, and our children's future is secure. Indeed, in the last Congress, we passed a labor HHS bill that supported middle class and working families, lifted up vulnerable Americans, and prepared our nation for future crises which makes it even more disappointing to see where we have ended up in this year's process. The majority's 2024 Labor, Health, and Human Services and Education Bill and its 28% cut of $64 billion brings us back to a level unseen since 2008. It heralds their intent to end public education in the United States. This bill eliminates the present and future job opportunities for young adults, for seniors, for working families, and it jeopardizes maternal, pediatric, and public health. The bill is shameful, which is presumably the reason why it was never marked up or voted on by the full Appropriations Committee. As disappointed as I am to see the authority of the Appropriations Committee surrendered, sadly, based on where the majority has taken this entire process, it is not surprising. 153 days ago, the House Appropriations Committee held its first full committee markup of a fiscal year 2024. Nine more followed. The bill was not one of them. This bill was not one of them. Nonetheless, the House majority circumvented the committee process by airdropping five new poison pill writers into the labor HHS bill without any bipartisan consultation or a vote by the committee. We are left to assume that the majority knew this bill had no path forward in committee, and they know it has no path forward, period. Horace Mann called education, and I quote, the great equalizer. Perhaps then it is the majority's aversion to equality that explains why they cut 28% from the Department of Education, taking at least 224,000 teachers out of low-income classrooms and eviscerating the programs that help at-risk youth build a bright future. This cut would entail a loss of 3,700 teachers in Alabama, 800 teachers in Idaho, 4,400 teachers in Maryland, 4,300 teachers in Tennessee, 6,500 teachers in Michigan, 5,000 teachers in Louisiana, 8,300 teachers in Georgia, 1,500 teachers in Kansas, 22,300 teachers in Texas, and 4,400 teachers in Arizona. I am deeply concerned about the impact such a colossal retraction from public education funding would have on children across this country. This bill tells the story of where the majority seeks to take this country. Republicans have made it clear they are opposed to public education, and they seek to destroy it. Quality education will no longer be accessible to working families, but the purview of the rich. I must underscore that point. This is no messaging bill. This is their, quote, commitment with America, end quote. I am taking Republicans at their word, as should all of the American people. This is what they want to do. 161 House Republicans voted earlier this year to eliminate all K-12 funding at the Department of Education in the Massey Amendment to H.R. 5. I was horrified, but that was only the beginning. House Republicans are in lockstep behind the most extreme ideologues in their party. Just this summer, former Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos penned an op-ed calling to eliminate the Department of Education. 
The Heritage Foundation's budget blueprint includes a proposal to eliminate the Department of Education and former OMB Director Russ Vogt wants massive funding reductions to, quote, thwart a public education system that he sees as, quote, an existential threat to the American Republic, end quote. We are witnessing a widespread attack on public education that should shock every American family. If left to their own devices, Republicans would gleefully take public education to the graveyard. So how will this move us closer towards those ends? English language acquisition funding to help 5 million English learners nationwide is eliminated, disadvantaging and discriminating against students who primarily speak another language and restraining their future ability to compete and succeed in the economy. Support of effective instruction grants, which provide professional development opportunities for educators, are completely gone. Federal work study is no more than 600, is no more for the 660,000 students who need it to help find, finance their post-secondary education, limiting their potential earnings and future su success in the job market. Nearly $1 billion is cut from the Supplemental Education Opportunity Grants, would eliminate need-based financial aid for 1.7 million students nationwide, promised neighborhoods, social and emotional, emotional learning grants, magnet schools are completely erased as well. And as the chairman said, over 50 programs are eliminated. And the, and the programs that are not completely abolished in this bill are funded so poorly as to be completely non-functional. A $14.7 billion cut from Title I, the very foundation of public education in America, is patently unthinkable, would remove hundreds of thousands of teachers from classrooms, directly harming children in every single one of our districts. Students nationwide are struggling with rising college costs, and this bill provides no relief by freezing the maximum Pell Grant for the first time in 12 years. Furthermore, a House Republican has submitted an amendment to this committee that would cut funding for Pell Grants by nearly $10 billion. If this committee makes that amendment in order, the House Republicans vote to eviscerate the Pell Grant program, it would go further to destroy educational opportunities in America. I believe we all agree we have a crisis in our nation's classrooms, but rather than address the teacher shortage and fully fund our children's future, our nation's future, the majority solution is to abolish the public classroom altogether if you cannot afford a private education for your children, too bad. This is the Every Child Left Behind Act. And regardless of your age or stage in life, this bill means you cannot count on your country for assistance to get back on your feet. Youth job training, adult job training, job course, senior community service employment programs are all eliminated. If you want to work, and just need help finding the right job or finding a better job, this bill has nothing to offer for you. They are putting workers who do find jobs at risk by cutting $313 million from worker protection agencies like the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and a 30% cut to the Wage and Hour Division, the agency that's taxed with enforcing wage law and ensuring that there are not children working illegally will send the rights of workers in this country back to the time before World War II. This bill hangs working families completely out to dry. Healthy Start, teen pregnancy prevention, Title X family planning, all abolished, and with riders that block access to abortions and reproductive health care services and force providers to withhold critical information about health care options. It is clear that the majority does not trust women to make their own decisions and want to move us to a nationwide abortion ban. These provisions amount to the majority simultaneously ensuring that anyone who may get pregnant will get pregnant, teenagers included, and that there are no resources, no lifelines available to help those children and families. People can only hope that they do not get cancer. You will not find support from the House Republicans. From the National Institutes of Health, over $2 billion is cut from the National Cancer Institute, the National Institute for Neurological Disorders and Stroke, the National Institute for Mental Health, and the National Institute for Allergy and Infection Diseases. Cuts to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention are as outrageous as they are dangerous. 
firearm injury prevention, tobacco prevention, ending the HIV epidemic. By, but, by the way, was an initiative of President Donald Trump. Republicans have decided addressing these problems is not worth a single dollar to the American people. What should we be doing if not combating the legal, the, the leading causes of death in this country? What should we fund if not the health and the future of America's families? Supporting our children and working family is the bare minimum of what the, quote, greatest country in the world should do for its people. But this bill goes below the bare minimum. This bill steals from our children's future, from our family's health, and from Americans' livelihood. It abandons young adults, stifles biomedical innovation, surrenders to current and future public health crises, and hurts women with poison pill riders on abortion. For these reasons, I vehemently oppose this bill, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. And if I might, I would like to uh, say a few words about the House Republican laddered continuing re resolution. Again, Mr. Chairman, I thank you. I thank the ranking member and the committee members. We are here considering what, if signed into law, would be the second continuing resolution. This is the fourth proposed continuing resolution. The first two attempts at a partisan measure failed to garner a majority support in the House. The third attempt, which could only pass with Democratic support, resulted in the removal of the Speaker of the House. In fact, House Republicans squandered most of the time covered by that bill to find a new Speaker. We have been under a continuing resolution for 44 days, and Republicans have not spent a single minute of that time at the table with Democrats working in good faith on full appropriations bills. This is a never-ending saga. For what reason should we believe that Republicans will change their tactics after this bill goes into effect, unless we are to embrace sequestration, which I know some members of this committee are enthusiastic about. House Republicans must begin negotiating a true top line right now. 153 days ago, the House Appropriations Committee held its first full committee markup of a 2024 bill. Nine more followed. We still await the fate of two bills, Labor, Health and Human Services, and Education, and Commerce, Justice, Science. Again, they never came to the full committee for deliberation. But the majority plans to consider those bills on the House floor despite never considering a vote on them in the committee, never marked up. This is out of the regular order. 153 days of House Republicans attempting, often failing to pass partisan bills without even a whisper that they are ready to sit down with Democrats to negotiating bills that can be signed into law. In trying to rally support for this bill, Speaker Johnson reportedly told members of the majority that this crisis is not of his making. If that is true, and if he wants to fix the process, we should be considering a bill to minimize the chance of a future shutdown and not a bill that doubles those odds. Ultimately, we are here because House Republicans broke the June budget agreement deal that they overwhelmingly supported, and that was signed into law by the President, which established a top line to be translated into allocations for each subcommittee. And Republicans continue to push appropriations bills that do not adhere to the law of the land that they agreed to. House Republicans have wasted time debating two bills that were so appalling that they had to remove them from the floor to avoid failing on final passage. House Republicans cannot enact an extreme agenda. Their ill-conceived, quote, laddered continuing resolution creates multiple future points of failure and doubles the likelihood of future shutdowns. In a time of global crisis, we should be promoting stability and not chaos. 
Critically, this bill does nothing to help our allies. It does not include any emergency assistance for Israel, for Ukraine, for Indo-Pacific partners, for humanitarian aid, or for our disaster victims here at home. At a time when the departments of state and defense need to quickly respond to global crises, the House Republicans would put them under a continuing resolution for nearly two months and, and breaching and, 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 and a perspective of three months. It is irresponsible to kick the can down the road for several months, keeping government services frozen, and hope that our challenges will go away. We are nowhere closer to a full year funding agreement than we were at the end of September. Congress must avoid a shutdown and must pass a continuing resolution that facilitates enacting full year spending bills and emergency assistance as soon as possible. It is somehow ironic that I am here testifying today on this continuing resolution at the same time we are looking at a labor HHS bill that is going to follow potentially the same trajectory that other uh, appropriations have, have followed with 335 amendments that will be narrowed down, but in fact has no real chance of passing. I thank you for the generosity of your time, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlelady. I'm going to uh, recognize uh, Chairman Adderhold for any thoughts he may have on the proposed continuing resolution? Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Cole. And um, again, uh, glad to be before the uh, Rules Committee for to talk about the CR as well. Um, and I'd like to thank by uh, or start by thanking Speaker Johnson for his leadership on this continuing resolution and a uh, our plan to move forward. Our, our nation is still uh, facing high inflation as a result of the massive infusion of government spending during the last Congress. Uh, record high spending caused record high inflation, as I had mentioned earlier, which has resulted in an added tax on every American. And uh, we must do everything we can here in Washington to reverse that course and to lower the burden on the American people. Uh, this year, House Republicans are changing how we fund government. We promise to cut wasteful spending, to return to responsible funding levels, and to consider the individual appropriation bills. Even with the President's late budget request and the debt ceiling negotiations delaying our process, House Republicans have continued to make progress in funding the government. Under the uh, leadership of the uh, Chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, Kay Granger, the bills that we have considered on the floor are some of the most conservative preparation bills in history. To date, we have passed seven full uh, bills uh, which account for 75% of federal spending, and that is in stark contrast to the Senate, which has only passed 17% of federal funding. The House and Senate clearly took different approaches on federal spending, which brings me uh, and brings all of us to the bill that's before us. Given our differences and that the Senate has only passed three of their bills, the bottom line is that we need more time uh, to complete our work. The two-step plan that Speaker Johnson has laid out uh, prevents a harmful government shutdown. It gives us more time to finish our work for the FY 2024 and ensures that we are not jammed with an omnibus just days before Christmas. You'll notice this bill doesn't include any emergency spending. We believe those issues, such as, as critical funding for our ally Israel, should be considered separately. I will note that the House already passed an Israel supplemental bill with bipartisan support back on November the 2nd. As to the specifics of the CR that is before us, it extends funding for agriculture, military construction and veterans affairs, energy and water, and transportation bills until January the 19th. The eight remaining appropriation bills are extended until February the 2nd. This will allow us to, to focus on a, the first set of bills while we work out the differences in the process and remaining the, on the remaining ones. The CR includes a handful of limited adjustments to prevent undue harm or delay. This includes uh, an exemption to allow the Department of Defense to continue procuring the second 
Columbia class submarine, and there's also provision that prevents senior executives and administration from receiving a increase in pay starting on January the 1st. In closing, I know that continuing resolutions are not ideal. And in a perfect world, we would be here today and have completed our work on FY 2024 and be preparing to start for FY 2025. Unfortunately, that is not the present reality and we need more time to work. Speaker Johnson needs more time and deserves our support. This CR keeps the government open and serving the American people while we work on the full year bills that reflect our conservative priorities. I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ranking member, members of the committee, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Uh, since the chair sat for many years with the ranking member on this bill, and as my good friend Chairman Adderhold noted, uh, I know it fairly well. I think I'll withhold my questions for now uh, in the interest of time. And so, uh, Dr. Burgess, uh, we'll go to you for any questions you might have for our witnesses. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> I think this is the first time we've had a Labor HHS appropriations bill up here in a long time. Wow. It's been a while, hasn't it? That's why it, uh, it's worthy of, of note, and, and I appreciate you working on it and, and bringing it before the Rules Committee because I think this is an important part of the process. I was, <clears throat> Chairman Adderholt, I was glad to hear you discuss the uh, <clears throat> holding back funding for gain of function research. This, um, as <clears throat> we work through the issues that have happened the last three or four years, this is one thing that continues to crop up, and certainly funding of gain-of-function research, certainly funding it in adversarial nations is something that I think we need to look at extremely critically. So I'm grateful that you included that in your, in your discussion. I'm also uh, glad to see the uh, focus on... <clears throat> programs that have not been reauthorized and how you're attempting to pull back uh, rather than just rubber stamp continued appropriations for unauthorized programs or programs whose authorizations have long expired. I am on an, on an authorizing committee. We do need to do our work. We need those programs that are valuable. We need to reauthorize and send them to the appropriations committee to be funded. And if they can't be demonstrated to be of value, then it is incumbent on the authorization committees to, to do that. But I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that, but I was glad to see you included that in your discussion today. Yeah. Well, thank you for mentioning about uh, those programs that are unauthorized, and that's something I think this, con this uh, Congress has continued got to look at, and uh, I think certainly that's uh, a real uh, a starting point where we can do a lot of work. And so I look forward to working with you as you continue your time here on how we can try to, to work on that more. You know, you mentioned uh, life-saving medical research in your, in your opening statement, and that is, that is critically important. Uh, have an amendment to the bill, which likely will not be made in order, even though all the power I hold at the Rules Committee. <laughs> but really, we have to look going forward to see Inflation Reduction Act gave enormous power to Health and Human Services, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, and they are in the process of creating a massive PBM, which will be bigger than any pharmacy benefit manager anyone has ever seen. And look, PBM has kind of become a four-letter word in the, in the past couple of years because of the of the restrictions they place on the, on the practice of medicine. But now we have a whole agency that is going to be creating de novo an entire bureaucracy staffed with hundreds and hundreds of people that will do nothing except prevent future investments in scientific research. And the reason I say that is we had a roundtable in the Budget Committee on just this issue with the Inflation Reduction Act. And, you know, the fact that we've got this new maximum fair price that came to us in the, in the Inflation Reduction Act, that's not a figure that anyone has ever been, has any, ever dealt with before. In fact, it is entirely made up 
by the Secretary of Health and Human Services, but that is what is going to govern whether or not companies are able to invest in, in future research and, and future discoveries. We heard quite clearly that, yes, you may be focused on one, one particular medication, whether it be a breakthrough or a generic, but the decisions made on that will have significant downstream effects on stopping or curtailing research in other areas. Again, both blockbuster and, and generic drugs as well. So this is something that I hope in the future we can look at. I, again, I tried to limit it as with an amendment, probably not gonna be successful in doing that, but going forward, we really do need to look at what CMS is doing in creating this massive new bureaucracy to uh, stand between doctor and patient and their, and their prescriptions. Thank you. Thank you. I'll yield back, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, the ranking member, recognized for any questions he may have for the panel. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let, me, let me begin by just saying, I, as I said in my opening statement, I'm, I'm very concerned that this bill shortchanges the WIC program, a program that provides modest food benefits to infants, pregnant, and postpartum moms and their young children. And we appreciate the uh, continuation of the authority to spend at a faster rate contained in the bill, but it does not solve the problem. If we don't provide extra money for the program, it will run out of money. And continuing to borrow against future months doesn't provide states with certainty as they make decisions on how to administer the program. States need to know the program will be fully funded for the year, or they could start turning people away. So Chairman Adderholt, can you please tell us why the continuing resolution that the Republicans are advancing this week does not include any of the administration's requested money for WIC? The, oh, thank you, uh, Ranking Member uh, McGovern. The, the CR continues the flexibility um, that is in the previous CR for the Department of Agriculture to spend at a fast rate of operations to maintain participation in the WIC nutrition program. Um, USDA has already received about $2.5 billion for the program, which is an in addition to any uh, funding states already have available. Uh, if there is a need for more funding during the CR, nothing prevents USDA from requesting additional funds from uh, OMB to maintain participation. If this becomes a problem, that's because the administration is purposely making it a problem for not allocating these uh, necessary funds. Ms. Deloro? Yes, um, if, I, if I might just say, say something. There was an emphasis here on how important uh, medical research is and the kind of medical research that we do. But I think it's un unbelievably uh, uh, shameful that we have cut $2 billion from the National Cancer Institute, National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, the National Institute of Mental Health. These days is really incredible given what happened in the pandemic. And the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases which is what brought us through the pandemic. To address your question for the ranking member on, on, on the WIC program, interestingly enough, that was uh, when we reviewed the anomalies, uh, the WIC piece and the, the, the administration's request for funding for WIC is eliminated in this continuing resolution, after has said. If we do nothing to support the WIC program, this is gonna mean that young families are gonna be turned away from receiving vital nutritional assistance. If we don't include it in the CR, the states that administer the program will start to think that the program is not going to be fully funded in the final 2024 bill, may stop enrolling people. That potentially puts current beneficiaries on wait lists. We included some flexibility in the last continuing resolution to get the program through this month. But that isn't going to cut it moving forward. In 2024, WIC will need an additional $1, one billion dollars to continue to serve all eligible participants. As written, this bill does not include a penny of that. If we fail to demonstrate that the states that we are prepared to back them up with appropriate, with appropriate funding, we can look forward to pregnant and postpartum women and young children being turned away from food assistance. 
The states are not going to be able to serve all eligible participants with the amounts of nutritional support required by the law. If we continue to ignore this at this juncture and without and, and kicking the can down the road, as we're doing in this continuing resolution, without adequately addressing the WIC funding shortfall. One additional point, the way the WIC system works, there's eligibility, it's an eligibility priority system. When we run short, we, we start to look at tiers. There's priority one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So in priority one, we, we, we begin to jettison those people who are at lower uh, 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 priorities. WIC participants uh, who, without providing WIC supplemental foods, could continue to have medical or dietary problems. Postpartum non-breastfeeding women with nutrition-related medical conditions or dietary problems. Children with dietary problems like poor diet. Priority four of, of the following applicants with dietary problems like poor that infants, pregnant women, these people will be gone from the program. Yes, we will deal with a priority one, pregnant women, breastfeeding women, and infants. You know, then we go to the various others. You know, children with nut nutrition-related medical conditions are priority three, which would, could be let go. Priority two, infants up to six months of age whose mother participated in a WIC or could have participated and had nutrition-related medical conditions. What they do is to structure it in a way that says if the money isn't there, who goes first? Which kid, which infant, which postpartum, which individual, which person is without the nutritional assistance that they need in order to help them to survive? Right. That's what this and means. I, you have made and my point. I have to have make one more yeah, point. Okay, I do. Okay, okay. Funding levels for WIC threatened to, job, to, to drop 600,000 uh, people from this program. And every day that we deny funds for WIC endangers women, infants, and child nutrition. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I, I, I just think, I think it's a missed opportunity here. Uh, Chairman Adderholt, when Democrats were in the majority, my Republican colleagues demanded regular order. Uh, now we continue to hear the Republican majority claim that they are proceeding with regular order but it seems to be a different de definition of what that term um, uh, means. Uh, and um, every week we hear a different definition. So I think we, all, we can all, I think we all agree, though, that skipping a full committee markup at the Appropriations Committee for initial floor consideration of a regular appropriations bill is highly unusual. In fact, we can't find any examples of, that, of it happening in over 20 years. So my question is, why did you skip the full committee markup on labor on the labor HHS bill, whose whose decision was it to skip the full committee markup, and do you think that was a good idea? Well, obviously, in a perfect world, as I'd mentioned, uh, we would have the full committee markup. But uh, we are trying. We have made a commitment to pass these appropriation bills, and we are in the pri here. We are in on it's November the thirteenth, and uh, time is ticking by. And we want the ultimate goal is to pass these appropriation bills on the floor. And uh, there is a, a couple of bills that we have had to take directly to the floor, and this is one of them. But like I said, in a perfect world, you're right. Was, was it your idea to skip the full committee markup? I this mean, was a decision by the committee to move forward, how to move forward. And uh, we're... Were Democrats you, consulted in that, or was this just a Republican decision? This, to, well, this was a, a decision basically by the, by the committee itself, by the, by the uh, leader, the, the chairwoman, uh, Granger, uh, to, to do it this way, but I, there was no objection for me because I felt like we need to move forward with these bills. And as you know, under our rules, when we were doing appropriation bills, you cannot be on the House floor debating appropriation bills while you're also in committee because the members of the appropriations committee have to be on the floor uh, to debate the uh, appropriation bill that's been debated. So yeah, but, there is, yeah, but, but that's so, always that's always the rule. That's not a new no, rule. No, yeah, right. Right, no, right. No, that has always been the rule. You're exactly right, and that's what I'm saying. I'm just reminding you that is the yeah. rule. So therefore, we have to stop taking appropriation bills forward on the floor in order to go back committee. So in order to expedite the expedite the process, and I think you would agree, we need to try to get these appropriation bills in regular order. And uh, yeah, but, but this is not regular. Mr. Lohr, were you consulted at all, or? 
Did you know about this? or No, we, we only were told that this was going to happen. But in addition to that, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, the, um, uh, there were, the airdropped five new poison pill riders into the labor HHS bill. This was without, again, without any bipartisan consultation or by a vote of the committee. So in two respects, they have ignored the regular order and the process that we normally follow for, for these bills without any consultation with the Democrats on the committee. So, uh, Ms. Errol, I, I mean, I think we all, you said we, we can all agree that we should move these forward in regular order. I think we all can agree on that, but that's, that's not what's happening. And so this is, I mean, this is kind of truly an unprecedented process. Not only did you skip the full committee markup, but someone actually made changes to the bill before it came to the Rules Committee. Uh, so the, these changes uh, were never debated in subcommittee or full committee, and Democrats obviously had no say in any of it. We don't even know which Republicans had any say in it, quite frankly. These changes were made behind closed doors by who knows. Uh, so, so much for regular order. You dropped in five new poison pill riders without any, de any debate and with no one's name on them. So my question is, why did these riders get secretly added behind closed doors with no debate or discussion? And are, are you the author of the changes? Um, and, um, you know, so well, ultimately, you know, this uh, being chairman of the, of, the, of the committee, of the subcommittee, uh, it certainly is, uh, you know, uh, I was consulted about this. And like I said, I agreed that we needed to move forward on these bills as opposed to completely stopping work on the floor on this purple, other preparation bills. And uh, ultimately, it's to try to get 12 distinct preparation bills right. out and that's what the goal is. And like I said, in a perfect world, we would have gone through uh, the uh, full committee, subcommittee, full committee. But uh, because of the, as you know, we were we lost the month of uh, well, I, October. I, I hear all that. I, I guess my question was, I mean, there were five new provisions that just kind of appeared. Um, and so th are those your provisions? Did you, I mean, who, we we who, who, the, the committee no decided how we wanted to move forward on it. But of course, obviously, it's here at the Rules Committee. And I know it won't go to the floor unless y'all approve. And let me, uh, um, okay, so we don't know really who, where these where these came from or who authored them or, or why they're in the bill. But uh, do all the Republicans on the Appropriations Committee support this bill? You know, I, I'm sure that just like every piece of legislation that comes to the floor, there's, you don't have 100% uh, on, from either party. But uh, I am talking with a lot of the members of the committee and uh, also the uh, just ranking members that are on the um, in our conference to, to talk to them about this legislation and getting very positive and, response. And and will this bill actually pass? Uh, well, that's that's I certainly. Mean, the I, I guess the question. I mean, if you know it's not going to pass, why are we doing this? I mean, we we no. We, I, I, I don't know floor. that it won't pass. No, we're we're. We I, have, I'm you, optimistic. You, that, you have a that whip, it, right? I mean, in. There must be a whip count, or I mean, uh, or you must know whether everybody on the appropriations. I don't think the, the bill has been whipped yet. So yeah, but do you know whether have you whipped everybody on the appropriations committee? I have just talked to various individuals, and I'm taught the members of the appropriations committee that I've talked to are supportive for the most part. There may be one or two, and of course, obviously, you you might lose one or two, but I'm optimistic. At the end of the day, we'll get them. Right. I have no further questions. Okay. Very much, gentle lady from Minnesota is recognized for any questions she may have for the panel. Gentle lady yields back. Gentle lady from Pennsylvania is recognized for any questions she might have for the panel. Thank you. Um, this isn't the first time this year or this fall that we've been here in House Rules on the brink of a government shutdown. Um, for months, the MAGA majority has been embroiled in chaos and dysfunction and wasting valuable time. Uh, trying and often failing to pass highly partisan appropriations bills along strict party lines. I mean, I'm, I'm really troubled by the description of the process by which this bill got here. Um, there was no markup by the Appropriations Committee. There were clauses that were parachuted in somehow between appropriations and reaching here in rules. Nobody seems to know where they came from. You can't say that even all the Republican members on the Appropriations Committee support them because they were never given the opportunity to do so. So I think we should all be concerned about the minority 
of the minority-driven process that we're seeing here. We're seeing bills plopped into rules and then headed to the House floor, and they haven't been subject to any kind of debate or regular order. Who is in charge here? Um, and just overall, we've been seeing a series of bills that make draconian cuts to programs that serve our most vulnerable constituents. Uh, and these bills, in addition, have pathetic poison pill <coughs> policy riders that are so extreme, we've seen that even members of the Republican caucus won't vote for them. Instead of coming to the table to work with us, to work with everyone in the House, um, in a bipartisan way, as Senate Republicans and Democrats are doing. Uh, the House MAGA majority continues to try to force the entire country to go along with their reckless, extremist approach to government funding, despite the fact that these bills are not going to pass the Senate and they're not going to survive uh, a White House veto. So now Speaker Johnson has proposed this laddered, continuing resolution to kick government funding the can down the road again and raise in the process the prospect of multiple government shutdowns next year. Um, but no matter how many times they change the deadline, this plan is not going to work because it's catering to the most extreme and noisy minority of this MAGA party. Um, and by using tactics that really undermine a lot of cherished American values and expectations, the bills that, that they've been insisting on bringing to the floor are outrageous attempts to insert culture wars into every aspect of American life. The MAGA majority continues to worship at the shrine of trickle-down economics, despite a half century of failure of that particular policy. And instead of making wealthy corporations and billionaires pay their fair share, they're trying to balance the budget on the backs of those most in need, particularly kids and hardworking families, and in ways that undermine our national security. So today, in addition to this laddered CD, we have, or CR, I'm sorry, we have before us the rule for labor, health, and human services, education, and related agencies, a bill that is supposed to be about ensuring high quality education, employment, and health care for all Americans. I find it difficult to see, say what I find most outrageous about this bill, and I really admire the ranking member's calm demeanor in discussing it because I I found it difficult to be calm when looking at what is in this absolutely ridiculous bill. Look, the majority has put forth legislation that slashes existing funding that is critical to American lives by a shocking 28% across the board. It's such an extreme bill you couldn't get it through the House Appropriations Committee. So instead, we're going to try to jam it through under cover of a looming government shutdown. This bill, among other horrible things that it would do, would kick thousands of teachers out of classrooms. It would slash programs that support maternal and child health, even as we have a huge maternal health crisis in this country, and worsening. It would take away job opportunities for half a million adults and youth. It would block access to abortion and reproductive health care. And it would eliminate, in the middle of a gun violence epidemic, it would eliminate funding for research on the prevention of firearm deaths and injuries. What the hell is this bill about? As a public school advocate and former school board member, I find it un-American that this bill would slash Title I funding by 80%. That's funding that was first authorized almost 60 years ago to ensure that low-income students have access to an equitable and well-founded education to equip them for the future. Um, we've heard that the justification for the Title I cuts is that it mostly just funds kids in big city schools. Well, I represent those kids. Philadelphia has one of the largest school districts in the country. The overwhelming majority of those students are low income, and those black and brown children deserve every bit of education that they can get. And this funding would slash almost 4,000 teacher jobs in our district. These kids are already dealing with being in school buildings that are over 60 years old on average. They have asbestos. They have lead pipes. And now you're going to cut the teachers, too. Obviously, I don't support this bill. 
or a rule to advance it. Um, I, it also is going to slash Head Start, which study after study after study shows has a return on investment that can be documented in terms of cutting future costs for special education, allowing kids who participate in the program to be higher earners and therefore contribute back to the tax base. So um, I, I just find all of this um, cutting to programs that have proven success because there's an unwillingness to tax billionaires is just outrageous. Um, Representative DeLauro, there's one other thing I haven't mentioned yet, and that is the um, cuts to the HIV program. Oh. Um, can you talk about that? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I'm happy to talk about that because that has been one of the gems of what we have been able to do in a bipartisan way with HIV. Going back to George Bush and PEPFAR, we have worked and the NIH has worked so hard mm -hmm. to bring us to a point when we, we are more than managing. We are looking at, and I, I would just say in the programs eliminated, the Ryan White program is eliminated, ending the HIV epidemic. That was a $165 million program. That is gone in, the, in, this, uh, in, 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 in this bill. Um, we have the global HIV AIDS. This is our CDC's contribution to PEPFAR is eliminated um, uh, there. And, and now, the, I, I, when I talked, there's over 50 programs, as the chairman pointed out, that have been eliminated. That is not to say of the other programs where there are unbelievable um, uh, de de decreases. Again, in the Department of Health and Human Services, Ryan White HIV AIDS program funded at $2.3 billion. It's $239 million less. Now, and we have been at the precipice here with FY, with fiscal year uh, 23, uh, we've been trying to look at how we provide that the last tranches of money to be able to end an HIV epidemic. And that's where this, these dollars were taking us. Now, they eliminate, including the elimination of funding for the ending the HIV epidemic initiative. This is really staggering um, uh, th that the amount of time, effort, and resources at the federal level that we have been spending on a bipartisan basis mm -hmm. to deal with ending this epidemic. It, it's, it's one of the highlights of what we're able to do to save lives in this country and what the federal government, with the work that we do in this committee, can save lives. And now they have upended all of that, either ended the programs or drastically, or drastically cut them, which I, I have to believe is it is untenable. The most noble thing that we do at this level in our government is and the programs that help to save people's lives. And we have been at the forefront of that, whether it's been the NIH, whether it's in the CDC, the Food and Drug Administration, and others. These are the gems of our government. And you will see at every level of these, they are being decimated. Thank you. I mean, I, I note that. I, I noted it because uh, early on in the AIDS epidemic, Philadelphia um, had a, a, a high impact there. It's certainly um, become better over time. And I note that in the most recent year, 52% of new HIV cases occur in the mm -hmm. South. It's only 14% in the Northeast. Um, but we have been making progress on this. Um, and the data shows it. But just to um, flesh this out a little bit, I'd ask unanimous consent to introduce a political article from 5 o'clock this morning entitled, An Extreme Response, Republicans Move to Kill Trump's HIV Fighting Program. Right. Without objection. Yeah, and the CDC, by the way, they would end the CDC ending the HIV epidemic, $220 million eliminated. Um, beyond, I know that um, one of my colleagues is going to get Several of my colleagues are going to get into other aspects that I'm also interested in. But the cuts to WIOA and the Job Corps, 
um, you know, we've got so many employment challenges in this country, and having Americans who are ready and able to take the jobs that are available is really, really important. Can you talk a little bit about the half million job development opportunities? Oh, my God. Th this is in the Department of Labor under employment and training. The WIOA Adult Job Training Grants, $886 million eliminated. We owe a youth job training grants, $948 million eliminated. Job Corps eliminated $1.8 billion. The Women's Bureau, which they totally eliminated the, 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 women's, the Women's Bureau. This says nothing of where, the, you know, we're, 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 we're looking at, um, in, 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 in labor, um, the worker protection agencies are cut significantly back. I mentioned wage and hour, which deals with child labor. Uh, uh, OSHA cut back. So I, what I set out to say was that in every aspect of a per person's life, mm -hmm. their health, their employment capability, uh, 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 their educational opportunities. This bill has mm -hmm. systematically, systematically pulled back mm -hmm. from education, from, 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 from health, and from employment and opportunity. I, I don't know how to say this best. Our job here is to make the federal government provide opportunities for people to help deal with the challenges in their lives. That is the potential of this institution. And we have followed that, and in many, many instances, on a bipartisan basis. We are looking at the elimination of public education in this country. We are denying the people the opportunity to be able to get employment, to have a job, both with education and with the jobs themselves and we are uh, uh, putting their health at grave risk with every step of the way in this piece of legislation. I mean, just reviewing it, it appears to be remarkably destructive. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention, I have 19 colleges in my district, and this bill would block student loan repayment regulations to implement student mm -hmm. in income-based student loan repayment. Mm -hmm. And it would also eliminate, so many of these programs are just eliminating, not just cutting, right. it would eliminate um, work-study programs in colleges. So um, I just, you know, yet another reason I can't support this bill. And with that, I yield back. Can I, can I respond? Uh, yeah, just, uh, I uh, thank you for your comments. Um, I take it, other than the things you mentioned, it's a pretty good bill. Oh. <laughs> No, I was trying not to abuse <laughs> oh, okay. my time. Here. Oh, okay. All right. But I do want to clarify. You, you asked about the changes to the bill. Uh, those, those, those changes that came forward came from our subcommittee uh, members. The, the, the changes that occurred. The changes that from the time they came to it came to here, here to the, yes. Republican members. Okay, yes. yeah, it wasn't. Put before the whole committee. No, it wasn't. No. But of obviously, and and so I mean, I you know I I approve these changes, trying to hopefully get in the bill that would that would pass the floor. But uh, let me say, I know that ultimately any changes that were agreed upon are ultimately going to have to be voted on the floor. Right. So there's nothing that's going to be uh, in this bill that will not be passing the floor. And uh, and also you mentioned. Uh, and, this being coupled with the CR to try to get it through, you know, this will be a standalone bill, so we will not be piggybacking on the CR. This will be a standalone bill in addition to the CR. I'm just here discussing this as in my role, not as not trying to put these. Responsibility not accepting not, No, not putting these two bills together for one. It'll they will be two no, distinct bills. No, I understand. Bills. Yeah. It's two separate bills. Okay. One gives I, didn't, I, I, I didn't want to get the impression that, Sorry. These bills were, were were paired together so that for passage of the labor H and a CR, these are two different Just bills. Just for purposes of the rule. I understand. Yeah. Thank you. I yield back. Gentlelady yield back, Chair. Thanks. The gentlelady chair recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for appearing. Congressman Idaho, um, I think the good provisions in this this bill eliminate 61 programs. 
including 49 that were never authorized. Uh, reduce funding for 54 other programs. Prohibits funds to promote or advance CRT uh, and implement the Biden administration's executive orders on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, maintains the bipartisan Hyde Amendment and stops any funding for abortions in this. Prioritizes medical research. What is the thought process that went into, I notice it does not defund masks or vaccine mandates? Oh, uh, well, it, it, it uh, when, you, when you say as far as doing away with the mask mandate, of course, obviously that was a big issue back a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, I know there was a lot of great concern about that, but with the way that COVID is now and under control, I'm, I'm not really, it was not brought to my attention that that's been a real critical issue that need to be addressed in the bill. But uh, obviously, if, you know, we're always open to how to make this bill better and certainly would look, be willing to work with you any way we can try to address that. Um, you know, I noticed my good friends from the left, they never talk about any, any cuts on anything. It's always okay. more spending. Uh, I guess it's a figment of our imagination. This country is in trouble. China and Japan are not buying our bonds anymore. Yeah, and and just it's been just I want to just mention to you about the the mandates. You know, uh, as I mentioned earlier in my testimony, uh, we do defund the C CMS uh, vaccine mandate. That is included. Oh, uh, and uh, and as far as I understand, there's no other federal mandates that are. Uh, concerning mask or COVID exist right now. So that was why there was not a need to it. But again, if there's something that we have overlooked, we're certainly happy to look at it. They've always, you know, they've talked about the Biden administration coming up with another COVID-2 and having plans to implement that at some point. Uh, thank you for your work on this, and uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Texas. I thank my colleague. From Texas, um, and I appreciate the, the witnesses for being here this afternoon. Thank you. Um, I would uh, ask one uh, general question. I mean, I think of each of you. I mean, it, I think it is uh, important as a backdrop in terms of what we're talking about in terms of the spending levels that it would be um, uh, appropriate to say that if you take the appropriations bills that Republicans have put forward to date, we've passed seven on the floor. We've passed another three out of committee uh, that have either been considered on the floor or, or in the midst of being considered on the floor. And then two, Labor H, and then obviously CJS that we might um, deal with tomorrow that didn't go through committee, went straight to the floor. I share the gentleman's preference, and I think that over here that, that it would have gone through committee before going to the floor, but, but we're, we are where we are on that. But the, the main point, though, is on the overall spending level. Is is it fair to say that if you take and add up all of the appropriations bills that we have passed out um, out of committee or these two at the spending levels that were set by the committee as they came to the floor, that the total spending levels would uh, achieve roughly, I think, about a 1584, 1586, something like that, top line? Um, and I, 1586. Yeah. And that which is a few billion acknowledged below the 1590 FRA level. Uh, so you can, I, I guess you could kind of uh, quibble over, you know, what's been cut in those, in that $4 billion. But putting that aside, it effectively is spending in compliance with the ceiling that was set in the highly bipartisan FRA. Is that a, yes. is a fair statement? Yes. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to answer that. Sure. It's $152 billion below the bipartisan budget agreement, and all of the cuts are on the non-defense side. $152 billion. $152 billion below. So fifteen eighty six is $152 billion below? Below the bipartisan budget agreement. But I, would, I would like to explore that. So $152 billion. And it's so all on, understand, the, it's all on the non-defense side. So 150, yeah, but the, the, the FRA agreement, which was struck, acknowledged a plus up in defense of roughly 3%, $28 billion. 
and of non-defense uh, that would then uh, make up in order to achieve FRA. But, but, but I think this is actually no, important. No, non-defense was cut. Right, in, in, in cut. the agreement in the FRA. Yes, agreed. which was overwhelmingly, uh, 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 this, uh, uh, overwhelmingly supported. I think that, that would, one has to go back to the premise that there was a budget agreement. And if I said many times here, I voted against the budget agreement. Same. Well, but it was overwhelming, overwhelmingly supported. Sure. And the reason why I voted for it was one, appropriations was not part of the process. <coughs> and secondly, I was very concerned as to what the level of the, uh, 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 of the allocations were, 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 going, were going to be and with regard to non-defense appropriations. And I say that because I come from a defense-dependent state, so I don't have any problems with that, that side of it. However, <laughs> the, you all walked away from the budget agreement and the fiscal responsibility bill. Without, within a week's period of time, you said no, that those top lines were not uh, uh, to be followed. And that is still what is happening now. So when you bifurcate what you're doing, you're going to, there is no allocation for each one of the, uh, of the subcommittees. So you go, you, you'll plus up one, lower ones, ones that you like, ones that you don't like, and so forth, which is really madness here in terms of a process to get us to a budget. So, but $69 so getting, billion dollars sure. in additional spending outside of the this, tax. This is an important, this is an important point, yeah, because sure. if, if the gentlelady is correct, that it is missing $152 billion mm -hmm. uh, when it, is, in fact, mathematically, undeniably, adds up to 1586, give or take, a, a couple of billion, again, within rounding errors. It, it, it's just a mathematical truism that what we're talking about in terms of the appropriations bills that Republicans have put forward, no, that the programmatic spending levels add up to roughly, again, roughly 1586. That then if there's $152 billion allegedly missing, then what I'd like to understand is, mm -hmm. is what is that? And I think for the American people to understand, it generally wants to correct or add something to yeah, it. No, no, I don't have to, I don't have to okay, correct. Well, what you're not, not considering is that you've got $152 billion below the bipartisan agreement. What you're not addressing is well, the, addressing. the $69 billion that was for emergency for base, for COVID and commerce, for the IRS rescission, and, so, and, 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 and the chimps, which added up to $69 billion. And that's exactly my point, and I thank you for making it. Because I'm happy, this, happy, I, I right. want, let's be accurate with the facts. Okay, well, there, I am being be accurate, accurate with the facts. The programmatic spending levels last year, $1.602 trillion. That's a mathematical fact. That was the, that's the programmatic spending level for, for DOD, for all of the non-defense programs, and obviously you've got veterans and uh, some that are uh, uh, energy and some that are part defense and part non-defense. So you've got a 1.602 level. And the question was, what was going to be our spending level? FRA was going to be at basically 1590 of the programmatic spending level, representing a reduction. 1586 would have been the automatic 1% across the board level. These are the numbers that we're looking at for the actual programmatic spending level. But the, but the, 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 the deal that was struck, which, which many of us tried to point out back in Memorial Day, was that there would be effectively backfill. Like if you look at the, the White House's own documentation when they were putting it out and putting it forward, $886 billion for defense, $121 billion for veterans' uh, medical care. Uh, and that defense level, this is the White House's own document that they put out, President Biden, comma, Democrat, budget level, 3% increase for defense, that's 886. Right. The veterans' medical care budget level, they put that number out, $121 billion, and then it says $637 billion for other non-defense programs, taking into account all agreed-upon adjustments, virtually equal to 2023. That'd be 637. That all adds up to 1644. Now, that would represent about a $54 billion number greater than the 1590 that we've been talking about in terms of the uh, overall spend with respect to relative to the 1602 last year in the omnibus spending bill. My point of that is... The gentlelady doesn't uh, think the numbers are actually re reflected or, or uh, didn't support it for a variety of reasons that she's already described. Um, for concerns about not spending enough, I have colleagues on my side of the aisle who were trying to explain to the world that we were that the spending levels were going to be something they weren't going to be. That's the, that's the reality because this is the problem here that we're talking about with respect to. I'm keeping my time for a second. The problem we have here. 
is that we've got $54 billion that we know of in chimps and in uh, other accounts, the $22 billion sitting at the Commerce Slush Fund, which we had an entire exchange in this committee about, where my Republican colleague, Mr. Schweiker, came in and said, well, why aren't we using that to pay for the um, Israel funding? Or why are we using that to pay for the FEMA disaster aid? You know why we're not using that, ladies and gentlemen? Because it's already set aside for this town and appropriators to use to backfill to spend more. That's the truth. And so we've got that money, $54 billion. You've got chimps, which no one in America understands what those are. And that, that's why we continue to spend at levels that are blowing the lid off of no, no, I, I, excuse me. I want to say, with all due respect to the gentleman, and I have high regard for your your your, your knowledge and the, uh, uh, the the dealing with 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 the numbers, but I don't know what you do know about an, about the appropriations committee or the history of the appropriations committee and and what it does and how it does it. The fact of the matter is. Let's not get away from, you all agreed, maybe you didn't, but the bulk of your colleagues, yes, and my colleagues, voted for a budget agreement. That was all part of it. But you made a determination. You know, civics class, 101. You pass it in the House, you pass it in the Senate, and the president signs it. It's the law of the land. Now, you chose not to go with the law of the land. You have come up with some other construct to deal with this, each bill on its own, depending on whether you like the bill or you don't like the content of the bill. That is not the way the process needs to be worked. You agreed. Whether I didn't agree, you didn't agree, but the bulk of the people in this body, in the democratic process, agreed to it. It is the law of the land. That's what we should be sure. following and doing well, this. If the you bifurcate lady, the bills, you if bifurcate the, if, the bills, and those bills bifurcated means that you will like ag, and you'll increase the number, though the bill went down on the floor. You don't like Labor H, yes. so you'll do it in. Now, that is one hell of a way to run a railroad. Well, if the gentlelady would like to, lady would like to explain, if the gentlelady would, like to, explain, if, the if the gentlelady would like to point in the bill, uh, in the law of the land that she just described, where the $54 billion is with respect to Chimps, could you, if you could point that out in the FRA, I'd love to see it. All I know is it was agreed to by the former speaker of this oh. house. If that isn't enough for you guys to move on, then I don't know what the heck to say to you. So that's the law of the land, side deals. That's how yeah. this town works, ladies and gentlemen. So. Yeah. Here's the, here's the fact. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're looking at here is a reality that everybody understands that has unfolded this year, is that we've been working hard to break apart a very badly broken appropriations process and try to rebuild it in such a way that the American people could possibly understand it or possibly understand why we continue to spend money we don't have. And what I would tell for the, for the folks out there, you know, following this on C-SPAN diligently, no doubt at home, uh, the reality is, um, that's the, 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 the re resistance we get, frankly, from staff, and I say that as a former staffer, as a chief of staff in the Senate, as a lawyer on the Senate Judiciary Committee, the resistance we get from staff from daring to ask questions as members of Congress of the Appropriations Committee, daring to ask questions as to where this money is going, how it's being used, the resistance we've gotten all year, and it is being amplified at this exact moment, because what the gentlelady just referred to is exactly the problem, and I don't cast aspersions to her description. It is precisely what we've gotten from both sides of the aisle, that if we dare ask a question about where all of these numbers are, that don't show up in black and white for the American people to see, that that somehow is a problem, that if there's a deal struck, okay, don't worry, here's where the spending levels will be, be here's what will be written into the FRA, Here's what will be passed on law for us to see on the floor of the House. And then there's all of a sudden side deals that are done to say, don't worry about it. We'll be able to use this account over here. We'll be able to, we'll be able to fund that program. Don't worry about it. The absolute abject resistance I got, even under this current uh, Speaker's office, when I raised the question about using the $22 billion of the Commerce Slush Fund to be able to fund Israel, it was just like, oh, my God, you can't touch that. Don't touch that account. That's the appropriator's account. That's just the truth. That's what we've run into. 
Will the so, gentleman well, yield I, for I one just, second? I'm going to move on from that topic. Just talk about the CR. Just out of Will the gentleman yield right. for a second? I'm just going to go. I'm going to move to the CR if, okay. if I can. I think, it's Th think about this. revenues. Think about revenues. Oh, we, we've had a serious conversation about revenues think, here, and what we've already think established about revenues here, and how much you're not and collecting. What we've what we've established what you don't here in want this committee, to time and time again, about revenues. What we've yeah. established here in this committee, time yeah. and time again, mm -hmm. about revenues, is that 19.2 percent of GDP is brought in in terms of revenues to the federal uh, government, in terms of what we're bringing into the Treasury. The third, among the three highest levels in the history of the United States, that is what we brought in in 2022. Now, we can argue about whether we could bring in more as a percentage of the outlays. This is all according to the Federal Reserve. We could argue about what those out outlays uh, uh, should be in terms of what, I'm not outlays, in terms of what we should be bringing into the Treasury. That's debatable. It's debatable about how we do it. It's debatable about where the tax burden falls, whether it should yeah. fall on individual X or individual Y, corporation X, corporation Y. <laughs> That's all, I think, a reasonable debate. <laughs> but the idea that you're going to solve our spending problem when we're at the third highest level or among the yeah. three highest levels of revenue to the Treasury we've ever had as a percentage of our gross domestic product is facially absurd. And it's part of the problem well, why we wh continue wh to What's go absurd the is allowing corporations to pay nothing. Okay. But if, 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 the, if the gentlelady's position is that we're allowing corporations to pay, to pay nothing, zero to pay nothing, then you can go down the road of trying to come up with policies to change that. But it will not change the fact at the moment. You can't that get that moment, here because the Republicans a, won't it be will for not it. Change the fact General at the moment controls. that the federal government is bringing in among the third highest levels of receipts to the Treasury it ever has as a percentage of GDP, according to the Federal Reserve. Not true. I assume the Federal Reserve is lying. I assume the Federal Reserve is inaccurate in its percentage of GDP that is being brought the into Department the Department of Treasury will tell you how much is being left on the table, a okay. trillion dollars, and a so, trillion and, dollars and every the year. Lady, if the gentlelady is correct that a trillion dollars is being left on the table, then go find the trillion dollars, but it won't change the fact that what we're bringing into the Treasury is among the third highest we've ever brought in. The fact is we've only brought in between roughly 15 and 19 percent of federal of GDP into the federal government since World War II. That's the actual mathematic put on a chart Federal Reserve truth. And so the facts are, oh, well, I we ought to magically, your facts, we're going to so magically bring in 25% or 30% mm -hmm. of GDP and cripple the American economy in the process, cripple jobs by going out and taxing our, our, our oh. uh, job the, the, creators the, into a The limit. job creators Please, who so buy stock wanna, options. Wanna, the well, from Texas controls the time. I understand that. No, we don't have, I'm done. Our awesome I, I don't but, but the reality is when we talk about revenue, that's, that's the truth. Ridiculous. And so we want to talk about spending, which is what this is about. What we've tried to do is produce, whether the colleagues on the other side of the aisle like it or not, and I would, and I would compliment the gentleman for the bill that he's put forward because it's, it's adhering mm -hmm. with the tenets of the FRA in terms mm -hmm. of the overall spending level. It's achieving the objective that was laid out under the FRA in terms of the spending level. And if we're going to find the cuts, they got to come from somewhere. And so they're going to come from some aspect of the programs that are, that are being put forward. I think there are things we could have done more, things maybe you could have done less. But I want to compliment the gentleman for what he's done to try to achieve the objective we laid out to achieve, to reduce spending on the discretionary account as one step towards the many we've got to do to achieve fiscal sanity. But one thing that I, I want to ask about the continuing resolution, because it's important because we're all debating it. And I understand that I think the gentleman supports it on behalf of the speaker, and a good number of my colleagues will, I think, uh, do so. I oppose the continuing resolution on, on October 1, um, and, and I will oppose this continu continuing resolution. But, but I think it, it merits um, recognizing that this continuing resolution and, I, and, I, and tell me, the gentleman, just tell me if you think I'm, I'm, I'm wrong, if, the, if, if any of this is incorrect, that this will continue the spending levels of the omnibus bill from last December, which was the $1.6 trillion spending level, and will do so for at least 60 to 75 days, depending on the, the, the various accounts, right? It will spend at that level. And it will do so, which means basically spending about $268 billion over the next two months, a little more than that, actually, for the ones that extend to February 2nd at the... Uh, levels of the omnibus spending bill, that level being $131 billion higher than the previous year of 2022. And the reason I think that's important is I just want to establish for our colleagues who, who may be watching this is that's what we're talking about. A FY23 omnibus spending bill passed in December right before Christmas, which we say we want to avoid. We're going to continue to perpetuate spending at that level, which is $131 billion higher than the FY22 level. And we're going to do that 
with the policies embedded in it that were adopted at the time, while we have a $2 trillion deficit. And when last week, Moody's downgraded the U.S. federal debt outlook to negative due to the burgeoning interest rates, debt, and deficits. And we just had a Treasury auction that was uh, less than stellar for the United States government. It would continue to fund the Department of Homeland Security, uh, led by Alejandro Mayorkas, that has released some two trillion, I mean, sorry, two million people into the United States, uh, including uh, allowing 1.7 million gotaways into the United States. And we offer no policy prescriptions in doing so for the next 60 to 75 days of funding. It will continue to fund the United Nations to the tune of 12.5 billion, including UNRWA, which has dollars which go directly and indirectly to the Palestinians and therefore Hamas, which is counter to our interest in standing alongside Israel. It will fund the, continue to fund the proxy war uh, that we've got going on with Russia, in, including the $300 million that we just voted down in September in the DOD appropriations bill. It'll continue to fund and extend the authorization of the uh, COVID uh, state with respect to uh, PAPA, BARDA, and CDC and NIH. Now, I would, I would note that a lot of those have been addressed in the Labor H bill, and I, wanna, I do want to compliment the mm -hmm. gentleman and the appropriations efforts in trying to address some of those things. Mm -hmm. But the CR, of course, by definition, does not, right? We will continue to perpetuate a lot of the things that were addressed in Labor H. Uh, it continues to fund critical race theory and DEI at the Office of the Pentagon. It continues to fund the abortion, terrorism, and transgender surgeries at the Department of Defense. It continues to fund the Department of Justice ATF's pistol brace ban. It continues to fund the EPA's uh, attack on the internal combustion engine. It continues to fund uh, farm, uh, and it extends the farm bill to September 30th with no reforms to food stamps. No reforms to FDA, USDA tyranny over the small ag in favor of big ag. No fixes to Chinese Communist Party ownership of U.S. farmland. I could go on and on. Those are the realities of what happens when you extend last year's funding levels as the majority party here. Um, I just think uh, we should try to do better. And I don't believe that this is the right approach that we should pursue. I would yield back. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. The gentleman yields back. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from New Mexico. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And you know, I think it's really important to bring back to this discussion issues that Americans can understand if they are watching on C-SPAN. And you know what? Several of them do. It's amazing how many people come up to me and say, I saw you on C-SPAN. I'm going, who watches C-SPAN? But they do. And something that I think they very much understand is that what we are pursuing here with these extreme cuts that are not consistent with the Fiscal Responsibility Act, it hurts our communities. They understand it. When I'm talking to my rural communities and I talk about an ag appropriations bill that takes us back to, was it 2007 levels, Ranking Member? Uh, they understand it. When we talk about an environmental protection and the cuts to those bills that take us back to the 1990s, they understand it uh, when we talk about Cutting education. Um, Chair, uh, I, I know, you know, I have a huge rural district. Uh, everybody who comes before here always has to learn about my beautiful rural district, right? Uh, and I love the communities I represent. They are Title I schools, Chairman. And you mentioned earlier that in terms of looking at these cuts, so many of the Title I schools are in big cities. But I don't really care if those Title I schools are in big cities or they're in the beautiful communities that I represent and I come from. Wouldn't you agree that a child, regardless of the wealth of their parents, regardless of how hard those parents might work and how little or lot they might bring in as a paycheck, that every child deserves a quality public education? Well, let me just mention, as I did in my statement, that there is estimated that over $20 billion uh, are still as un unspent, uh, still remains for these provided during the pandemic to these schools. And it is just our opinion from the preparation standpoint from the majority side is until this funding is drawn down, that it's used responsibly, uh, then we should not continue to make further investments. In but, but what I think that ignores is that in my district, uh, our schools are responsibly pulling down and spending money, but that these Title I schools, that the cuts you are making, and is it 80% ranking member? Yes. Imagine, imagine any school that is relying on that funding to all of a sudden 
have 80% less funding. And some schools might not be using it as quickly as others, but imagine those schools that are relying on it to get 80% less funding from one year to the next, what it means. In my district, we've looked at it. In New Mexico, we've looked at it. It is, it is a lot of teachers. It is a lot of teachers, and you've recognized that it's teachers in your district as well. Do you have an, do you, do you have an idea of how many teachers might be cut in I your district? I don't have any number of hand, but again, we when there's money that is in the government that's not being used, then that's where, you know, as... As, as uh, well, Congressman uh, Roy mentioned, you know, we have to find some of the cuts somewhere, and this is one of the places that we... But, 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 but once again, you were, you were taking this macro and saying, not everybody's using this money, so we are going to cut all schools, right? Am I right, ranking member, that yeah. they don't say, if you haven't utilized the money, Alabama. you don't get the new money until... This is a cut to the schools. And by the way, you might go back and talk to your teachers. You will have 3,700... Teachers in Alabama could lose their jobs because of the bill you're proposing. In New Mexico, we're a smaller place at 764 Title I schools. In New Mexico, it is so many of my schools. It's over 700 of the schools in my district and in New Mexico will lose their funding. I cannot let that happen. So that's why I must join with our ranking member when she says no. And that's why when, you know, or the good gentleman uh, from... Texas goes on and on about these different monies and this and that. It confuses everybody. And what's he yelling about? And there's a yell out of yelling that comes across. And I like it, ranking member, when you calmly share the grave implications of this bill. Because we don't need to yell, as we heard. I think we just need to communicate what will happen to things we care about. Head Start. I'm a Head Start baby. I, I do not think it is a conflict of interest to continue to advocate for quality early childhood education. Uh, Chairman, you know that quality early childhood education makes a big difference in a child's life, right? I'm sure, yes. Right, right. I'm you sure know, it does. I mean, we have great, we have great studies. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may move into the record, Head Start, the public preschool program, more than pays for itself. That objection is ordered. Because uh, this shows that when we spend a dollar on a child of when they're four, five, when they're ready to go to school, but their parents might not have the money, that it pays for itself, and then more, we get so much more back. You know, and then when we talk about, so, you know, here's the early childhood kid, the little four-year-old. Uh, then we have our Title I, our K through 12 schools, cutting. Then we have those kids who might want to go and get uh, become welders. They might want to become dental assistants. Uh, you would agree, I'm sure, that we should support whether you want to go to college or whether you want to go get your journeyman's license, whether you want to go to community college to become a dental assistant. We should support those. Wouldn't you agree? I, I think you certainly the, you can make that argument. And, uh, but I'm just, you know, the problem is that we have, you know, and from the preparation standpoint and from this nation, is that we have to find the cuts somewhere. And in order for this to, to move forward, and when there's money that's still on the table, we, we're we trying to look at, because there's a lot of programs in here that we, we didn't cut and right. that we tried to make sure. But well, at the know. end of the day, you know, we did have to make some cuts and they're very hard. I mean, in a perfect world, this, you know, uh, we would not be doing a lot of the things we're doing in this. But we are not. Live, we have a thirty-three trillion dollar debt in this country, and it's not a perfect world. And so we do have to make some hard decisions. And this is some of the places that we're going to have to make them as we move forward. And uh, like I said, you know, I by no means say this is a perfect bill, but uh, we're under very unusual circumstances in this country right now with the debt that we have and that we're not even trying to make some changes. And I think it's time that we do make some changes and some cuts in this country. And uh, we sometimes have to make those hard decisions. So, so this is the thing about we have to cut. Like, to say over and over again, we have to cut. When one, cutting at these levels, cutting at 28% is not consistent with the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Cutting at 80% of those programs that are most in need is not consistent with a must-do. And when we talk about revenue, 
every time you guys come up and we have the Republicans talk about revenue, you know, I have a wonderful chart that I have entered into the record uh, before, and we will enter into the record again, that talks about the cause of that deficit. And the cause of that deficit were the tax cuts that went primarily to the wealthy and the corporations who still don't pay. And they began with Reagan, they continued with Bush, they continued with uh, Trump, and that if we didn't have those tax cuts, we would be at a level playing field now. Uh, and I think that that's it, that it is not a we have to cut. You are choosing to cut. And when you choose to cut from those most vulnerable, from those who have told me, come and fight for me, go and take your voices, that's when I need to raise my voice just a little bit about this isn't right. And it, it, it's not right. And you said, in your, you said in your opening as well that, you know, it's because of inflation. We have this big issue with inflation. Um, and, you know, I, I need to take, take, I need to address that one as well. Because we have uh, the Federal Reserve, the Kansas Federal Reserve, uh, has done a report that says that 60% of the inflation came not because we were helping people keep a job when the pandemic was so dark. Remember, do we, people remember how dark it was in those dark days of the pandemic? We need to remember how dark it was. People were losing their jobs. They were afraid. And we did, with the American Rescue Plan, make sure that our downtowns did not shudder, that people had unemployment, that they had jobs. But what caused inflation, Putin's war. And so for those of you who are unwilling to help Ukraine, remember, when Putin invaded Ukraine, he caused some of that inflation. Remember that. Two, 60% of the inflation in this Federal Reserve report comes from corporate greed, right? And we know that there are record profits being made. So when you <coughs> say we need to cut, it's not teachers who are causing inflation. When you talk about inflation, it's not teachers that are causing inflation. It's the corporate profits. And if we could only collect some of that tax revenue, and that's what you were speaking to. Is that right, ranking member, when you were talking about the need to, to collect, the, need to collect the, the, revenue. the taxes that are owed? So, you know, I'll, you know, it's been a long night, and um, uh, I would uh, seek unanimous consent, Mr. Chair, to enter into the record uh, the, two, uh, uh, um, the, two re the two articles, uh, with including the report on the, uh, uh, by the K Kansas Fed, noting that profits were responsible for 6% of inflation. That objection is so ordered. So, you know, um, early childhood, all of those programs uh, that, that the, the ranking member summed up, as I see this, H.R. 5894 literally steals the future of our kids at every age, whether they're a four-year-old who wants to go to Head Start, a sixth grader who lives in a poor community, whether it's an urban neighborhood, a rural one, and goes to a Title I school, or a 17-year-old who's trying to train for a new job. I look at this, and I see that those are your priorities, and I need to say they can't be mine. And so I will be urging and voting against both the rule and the bill. And then going quickly to the rule and the CR. Oh my God, here we are again, right? Here we are again. <laughs> like at a point where we are, we, are, we are a few days out from a government shutdown. A few days out from a government shutdown. And it didn't have to be this way. That's what the whole purpose of the Fiscal Responsibility Act was, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Ranking member, is so that we won't have to go through this. No, we, 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 we did that. It was a, a, a deal that was um, uh, agreed to uh, overwhelmingly in, the, in this body. And uh, as I say, it, and then immediately it was rebuffed. We also had a continuing resolution uh, that we moved forward, which gave us another 45, 47 days to do something. And during this period of time, the time was squandered to bring up. I'm all for bringing up bills and doing something, but we've had one bill that failed, two which 
couldn't make it, and yet we're continuing this trajectory, which I said earlier, the ironic part of my testifying here today is that I'm talking about a, 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 a CR, which a continuing resolution, which they say is going to address this, you know, issues in, in, in the future. And at the same time, we are going down the same of, of path to perdition <coughs> with a bill, with amendments, most of which get defeated, which will go nowhere. And who knows? I think that the chair said that he doesn't know whether or not there will be the votes for the bill and that we get to the point after, you know, going through hours and hours and hours uh, that the bill then has to be pulled from the floor, like the two that were last week. And, and then we have two more coming up this week, and those two could be in this very same position. As a matter of fact, those, these two bills did not even go through the full committee to get, to get marked up with uh, uh, unbelievable uh, amendments. The time has been squandered. We should now be focused on an allocation coming from the budget agreement with each of the subcommittees, let the House and the Senate appropriators hammer it out like we have done in the past in order to pass appropriations bills that will fund the government of, of for 2024. My fear, my real fear is that, I said this earlier as, as well, there is a trigger that goes into place on January 1st, which um, uh, uh, goes back uh, to the, um, uh, uh, takes uh, the defense takes down to 850, increases non-defense to 736. That is only temporary. When the bills are passed, we go to the uh, non-defense once again, goes back to its a dollar amount, defense goes up. But that process, 44 days in which nothing has been done, if you transfer that, we could be into April before, and we would just see six months where there is no budget for 2024 as well. And that is a, a reality. We cannot dismiss that, given the nature of the bills and the cuts that we are talking about into trying to come to some sort of conclusion on where we should go. And not conclusion, some sort of a meeting of the minds, compromise. We win some, uh, 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 colleagues, with, we go back and forth, which is what we have done in the last two years with the appropriations bills to get them passed. And you know what? We don't need an omnibus bill. We can do many buses as we have done in the past. So that this notion that you have to go in that direction is just, is just really kind of spurious. It's, it's just made up. We can come to a conclusion. Let's get the uh, appropriators focused on the bills uh, and get away from this madness which will occur over the next two days. On the, or, or three days on the floor of the House. Thank you very much, Ranking Member. And the chaos and confusion that is being created with the constant flirtation with the government shutdown is not good for America. It's not good for our allies. It's not good for anybody. It is bad for our economy. It's bad for the trust in the system. Uh, Chairman, uh, I saw you voted for the Fiscal Responsibility Act. Your ranking member did not, but she is willing, and I hope you are willing to work on a bipartisan basis to move us beyond this point. And with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Chair, thanks the gentlelady. Gentlelady yields back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Langworthy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I have no questions at this time. I want to really thank the witnesses for all the, the time that they've spent here with us, though, today. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Seeing no further members to ask questions, Chair appreciates the presence of the two witnesses today, and this panel is excused. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Okay, my dear. Yeah. Take care. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Thanks for cutting in, Stark. That's the biggest waste of money. <laughs> You're welcome. That's a contrast to the comments I just got earlier. And it comes down to this. Yeah. 
Do you believe that parents should raise the children or the government? Right. Okay, I, 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 I guess I will be going to steering and policy. It wasn't clear that I was going to be, so now the issue is, let's just talk. Mr. Crawford, please uh, have a seat at the witness table. Mr. Boylan, take a chair. We'll move along. Very well. I think we have all the witnesses at the table or at the dais, and we're prepared to take uh, testimony on your amendments. Mr. Griffith, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it greatly. I have probably the simplest amendment you're going to have today. If you look at page uh, 122, line 22, and my amendment's number 229. But if you take a look at page 122, line 22, uh, it says that notwithstanding any other provisions of law, no federal funding may be made available to Eco Health Alliance, Inc., located in New York. Being the lawyer that I am, when I read that, I thought, yeah, I can see lawyers getting into a fight, whether that applies to money that goes to Eco Health in locations other than New York. So the amendment strikes located in New York and just says it doesn't go to Eco Health, which I think was the intent of the underlying uh, language. And I'm just clarifying it so we don't get into legal fights with people who think like I do, which is sometimes odd. I yield. <laughs> Chair, thanks. A gentleman, a very succinct amendment. Mr. Smucker, you're recognized for any discussion you have on your amendments. Thank you, uh, Chairman, uh, for having us. Uh, my amendment is amendment number 176, and I ask that it be made in order. And this amendment would prohibit the Department of Education from implementing, administering, or enforcing a very narrow provision of their finalized rule on financial responsibility regulations which in my view unfairly limits federal financial aid from being accessed by what are called clock hour programs. Uh, and clock hour programs, career oriented programs, some community colleges use clock hours to measure uh, students' progress rather than the credit based system that traditional colleges use. Each state establishes their own licensure requirements and minimum number of uh, clock hours for programs like uh, cosmetology, massage therapy, barbering, nursing, and allied health, trucking, and others uh, before students can apply for their state license. Many programs have then courses that go beyond the state's uh, minimum hours uh, for a number of reasons, uh, allowing students more time to practice their trade, to increase their speed and income when they get to the job, uh, and in many cases, including new techniques and practices in instruction to ensure that students are prepared uh, to pass licensure exams. Um, and in part, the Department of Ed has traditionally allowed career-oriented programs and some community college programs to go above 150% of a state's minimum number of clock hours and still be eligible for federal financial aid. But this recent rule would eliminate the 150% rule and states that any program that deviates from their state's minimum number of hours will not be eligible for federal financial assistance. And what that means for schools in my area is that they would uh, need to redesign, recertify their programs, which is a very uh, time consuming process, or students will have to pay in cash or private loans for the entire program. Uh, today, it's estimated that more than 3 million skilled trade jobs uh, will remain open by 2028. Uh, and I think at a time when our nation is struggling to fill these roles, employers cannot find uh, qualified workers. Uh, it's not the right time to make it harder for students to uh, access um, these programs that will prepare them for the workforce. So again, uh, my amendment would ensure that the department cannot fund this provision regarding program length of its uh, in its final rule and would allow students to continue to use the federal financial aid they're eligible for to fund their studies. So uh, thank you to Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I ask that my amendment be made in order, and I, I yield back. Thank you. 
Sure. Thanks, the gentleman. Mr. Boylan, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today, I testify in support of my amendments to the Labor, HHS, Education, and Related Agency Appropriation Bill. As we continue to discuss and debate the Appropriations Bill, I ask that we not turn a blind eye to the realities of my constituents on Guam. Regarding health care, there are two civilian hospitals on Guam, one of them being the Guam Memorial Hospital. This hospital serves not just the entire island, but the region. GMH is infested with mold and is falling apart. The walls of the hospital are caving in, and the atmosphere is poisoned with toxic mold. Without adequate funding and attention, it will not be long until we witness the collapse of healthcare system on the island. Recently, the Federal Emergency Management Agency inspected the Guam Memorial Hospital and has determined its condition to be in need of full and complete replacement. I urge my colleagues make in order my amendments to H.R. 5894 increasing the appropriation for Small Rural Hospital Improvement Program, also known as SHIP, so that hospitals on Guam may apply for grants to revitalize their infrastructure and provide higher levels of care to patients on the island. Mr. Chairman, regarding Guam's workforce, currently federal regulations view the workforce issues through a monolithic mainland focused lens. This is especially true when discussing increasing the minimum wage exemption level for federal contractors. During the Trump administration, the territories were exempt from this practice and were left to let their local markets dictate the cost of labor. In September of this year, the Biden administration proposed hikes in the exemption level of minimum wage for U.S. territories. This labor market on Guam looks entirely different than the market in the states and must be treated as such. A change this drastic has dramatic effects on our local economy, potentially worsening the already existing inflation that is hurting my constituents. I ask my colleagues to support Amendment Number 331, which provides relief to Guam's economy. And Mr. Chairman, on education and technical training, Amendment 338 adds $10 million to the Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Program with offsets. It is essential that we in the United States grow our trade education programs starting at the federal level. Without federal dollars, this patchwork of state and local programs supporting technical education will never fully realize its potential. And on a final note, Mr. Chairman, the continuing resolution being considered today, just as the one adopted on September 30, 2023, extends the payment under the Compact of Free Associations to FAS nations, based on calculations established in the previous COFA agreement which expired September 30th, 2023. All this while Congress decides the markup, the makeup of the next COFA agreement. However, Mr. Chairman, what the CR failed to consider as the CR in front of us today also fails to re recognize is that the host communities who were reliant on the reimbursements from the previous agreement were not provided any funding. This unfairness needs to be rectified. The new agreements will address benefits for the host communities when they are adopted moving forward. So it makes no sense that in the interim, the host communities get no benefits while assuming the costs associated with the extension of the previous COFA agreement. This is why I'm submitting an amendment to the CR which provides the benefit of the previous COFA agreement on a pro rata basis to host communities, just as it does for FAS nations. This is a practical amendment. We can't say COFA agreement are only important for FAS nations without recognizing the sacrifices 
of the host communities such as mine. So I ask my colleagues and I urge you to see the disparities in my district and join me in revitalizing the healthcare system, ensuring robust market activity and expanding educational opportunities and the COFA for host state and territories. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Chair, thanks the gentleman for his thoughtful amendments. Chair recognizes Mr. Grossman. Yeah, I have a, I have, I have two amendments here. I just have to talk loud. Um, we have two amendments here. The first deals with uh, competitive integrated employment. It's uh, increase and decrease funding, but what it comes down to is they passed the WIOA Act in uh, 2014. And at the time, uh, when they came up with the administrative rules connected with it, they made it much more difficult for local boards to assign people with disabilities to a, uh, uh, or to, to uh, um, uh, uh, they, they define competitive integrated employment. And the idea is when you have people with disabilities, they want them to improve and, and uh, you know, get uh, uh, more involved in the community. But what a lot of you may have in your district is what used to be called sheltered workshops where kids who are kind of handicapped or adults who are kind of handicapped work together. And there's some people who are philosophically opposed to that sort of thing. And as the result, they made it very difficult for the local agencies to assign uh, or to recommend that some of these employees work in what used to be known as sheltered workshops. Uh, just as a side light, you're all in politics, I strongly recommend that you tour these workshops sometime because it's really exhilarating to see these uh, folks with maybe Down syndrome or whatever working maybe for less than minimum wage but um, being part of society. Uh, but I think the people who are opposed to that sort of thing and say you can't have a bunch of these folks working together, um, they did them a disservice and resulting in less people working in these settings and frequently not working in these settings, they wind up not working at all. So what we want to do here in this amendment is to go back and make it clear that uh, your state agencies, your vocational rehab agencies, uh, go back to the day in which you could recommend uh, these people with handicaps work in what used to be known as sheltered workshops. So that's the first one. The second one is we want to prioritize money for the CDC to do a study on the effectiveness of vitamin D against COVID. I think uh, the public health establishment and, uh, did a disservice to Americans in not emphasizing the degree to which vitamin D could have saved a lot of lives. There are all sorts of studies out there, but among other studies, it's shown that if you have a vitamin D deficient, you're like 14 times more likely to either get severe COVID or die of COVID. You know, you see all these ads when COVID was going on and you wouldn't tell people, I think you could have hacked the number of deaths, you know, to one eighth or one tenth of what they were if the American public was taking vitamin D like they should have. I think it also would have helped if the medical community, if somebody came in for a checkup, did a test on vitamin D. And if you would have found out you were deficient, you could have reckoned more, recommended more vitamin D, people take more vitamin D, they would have survived. It's particularly important to people of color. You know, I think of all the, all the black people who died unnecessarily because they did not have adequate vitamin D in their system. But in any event, I'd like to have a study which I'm sure would confirm what I'm saying and what a lot of professors are saying at that time and a lot of people in other countries were saying, take that vitamin D. I mean, of all the mistakes we made during COVID, I think we made a lot of mistakes. I think a lot of people are, should be alive today who weren't. But if the public health establishment and uh, the medical establishment with all these billions of dollars we were spending out of this place had educated people on vitamin D, I personally believe, having talked to a lot of experts in the field, I think maybe only one out of eight people who died would have died. Largely it was a, 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 a pandemic accelerated by or pandemic hitting people who were vitamin D deficient. 
Those are the only two I have for you today. I'm sorry. Just two. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. Uh, the gentleman from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have three proposed amendments I'd like to address today. Amendment number 62, 63, and 65. Um, they are connected to each other, so I'm going to discuss them all. Imagine, if you will, Mr. Chairman, a, a salt mine in South Louisiana has been operating for a long time, very successfully, very safely, and outstanding records of um, worker safety and and I mean, Morton Salt, <laughs> it's in every kitchen across the country, from sea to shining sea. When it rains, it pours. That's the, that's the, that's the sand. So the Morton Salt Mine <clears throat> has obviously comes under the, the regulatory um, supervision of the MSHA, the Mine Safety and Health Administration. And the MSHA has inspectors. So a particular inspector working this mine decides he wants a job at Morton. So he applies for a job. He doesn't get it. Doesn't get the job. All of a sudden, his, his role as an inspector begins to include a tremendous increase in notices of violation or failure for the mine. Clearly appeared to be targeted and vindictive. So this was obviously addressed through chain of command at the mine, through the, through the MSHA. Say, hey, this guy is abusing his authority. Please do something about this. Nothing was done. So eventually this becomes a congressional concern. It, this, the constituents go to their congressmen and senators and say, this is wrong. What's going on? Our, our mine has been injured, hundreds of jobs injured, and it's clearly the action of uh, retribution, appears to be, by a particular inspector. So I have an entire investigative file, Mr. Chairman, and I'm, I'm, I'm turning it over to the Department of Labor's Office of Inspector General. I'm asking for appropriate investigation. And my, two, my three amendments, you have two home and rule amendments and one reallocation of funds amendment. So essentially, we are asking the, the, the House to consider reducing the salaries of two key MSHA officials. We propose re reducing the salary of Christo Christopher William, Christopher Odell, excuse me, Christopher Williamson, William Odell, to one dollar. And we propose reduction of, uh, of one million from MSHA's budget and redirecting those funds to the Department of Labor's Office of the Inspector General. So essentially, <clears throat> we're using a home and rule to hold the men accountable that were involved in either the actual behavior of um, abusing their regulatory authority in a targeted and vindictive manner or supervising that action and not taking action when it was called to their attention and, and asking the Inspector General to investigate it and using funds from MSHA to pay for the investigation. That's in essence the nature of my three amendments. I ask them to be found in order and ask for due consideration by my colleagues. I yield. Chair, sure, thanks, the gentleman. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Burgess. Uh, members of the committee, um, thank you for allowing me to testify on this bipartisan amendment to the FY24 Labor, Health, and Human Services Education Related Agencies Appropriations Act. My amendment, number 150, uh, which is co sponsored by Representatives Amade of Nevada, Claudia Tenney, uh, Blake Moore, Jennifer Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico, Zachary Nunn, uh, Lori Chavez de Rima of Oregon would restore the Job Corps program to its 
fiscal year 23 funding level, which is approximately $1.76 billion. The underlying legislation eliminates uh, funding for Job Corps entirely. Uh, the <laughs> amendment is fully offset. Uh, it rescinds the $5 billion in unused Department of Labor funds that were authorized under the CARES Act and intended to go to administrative costs for a temporary unemployment insurance program uh, known as TFFF. Uh, this mandatory appropriation would be rescinded and then reappropriated to Job Corps as well as to deficit reduction. Uh, a September 2023 Department of Labor Inspector General report found that of the $12.5 billion in funding that was made available to the 53 um, state workforce agencies through the uh, TFFF program, nearly $5 billion of it remained unused as of July 31st of this year, which is more than 22 months after the benefit eligibility period which expired. Uh, and there's no formal plan to reconcile the state's accounts and to de-obligate the, the remaining funds uh, to return it to the Treasury. Uh, these are unused Department of Labor funds for which the authority has expired. It's entirely appropriate to repurpose them to save uh, the Department of Labor's Job Corps program, uh, which has paved the way for millions of young Americans to receive education, training, and career opportunities for nearly 60 years. I'd be grateful if the Rules Committee would accept this bipartisan amendment and allow it to be brought to the full House for a vote. Uh, as a co-chair of the Bipartisan Friends of the Job Corps Caucus, I know that many members of the Rules Committee have been stalwart supporters of the Job Corps and have seen firsthand the benefits in that district. I've worked with uh, Chairman Cole in his previous role as chair and ranking member of the uh, House Labor HHS Appropriations Subcommittee. And throughout his tenure, he's worked tirelessly to ensure that Job Corps has sufficient funding. Uh, Oklahoma has three Job Corps centers that serve nearly 900 students, and the Cherokee Nation operates one of the Job Corps centers. Our ranking member McGovern is fortunate to have the Grafton Job Corps campus in this district, and he's been a longtime champion. Uh, Representative Massey has the Whitney Young Job Corps campus in Simpsonville. Uh, Representative Ledger Fernandez has the Roswell Job Corps campus in her district, and Representative Langworthy has the Casadaga Job Corps Academy in his district. Representative Scanlon has the Philadelphia Job Corps campus in her district. So earlier this year, uh, Representative Hoochin and Langworthy joined a bipartisan Job Corps appropriations letter, which I led with my fellow co-chair, uh, Representative Guthrie, and that called for the Appropriations Committee to maximize funding for the Job Corps at 24. I'm proud to say that this letter gathered 134 signatures and support, uh, and when the, administ the last administration attempted to close the Forest Service Job Corps Civilian Conservation Centers, 81 of uh, my Republican colleagues voted for an amendment which was co-led by Congressman Newhouse to uh, ensure that the campuses remain open. I'm not going to continue, but I do urge you to uh, uh, consider uh, making this uh, amendment in order. Uh, there may be some issues uh, with regard to points of order, but I believe that uh, we can and have addressed those. I won't go into that now because of time, uh, but I'd urge you to consider it. Uh, this is broadly supported. It's bipartisan of the members of this committee and the full uh, uh, committee and the House are supported, uh, and we urge that these funds be uh, repurposed uh, for purposes of continuing the Job Corps. Gentleman yields back to your thanks. Gentleman, gentleman from New York is now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the committee. I'd uh, like to briefly uh, uh, point to uh, four amendments that I've submitted for consideration uh, among some others. Uh, the first, uh, number 31, uh, directs the Department of Education to address what I know we all, all have seen uh, with great alarm and concern, and that is uh, to address and ensure that students on college campuses are protected against anti-Semitic activity and to ensure affected students have access to adequate uh, counseling and trauma-informed care on those campuses. Uh, without question, the recent vile attacks against students on college campuses across America are, in fact, disgusting. And this amendment reinforces that no student should be attacked for their faith and that uh, support should be available to those students regardless of that faith. My second and third amendments, number 32 and 33, are specific to the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. I've been before this committee before on uh, both amendments and legislation to broaden 
uh, both awareness and access to special education services. These amendments highlight the importance of ensuring school districts inform parents of the right to have a third party advocate in individual education planning meetings, uh, as well as emphasizes the importance of supporting students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It's bad enough that in many cases students with disabilities are left uh, to navigate the system without support. It is worse yet uh, that entities uh, don't advise parents of their right to third party advocates in these settings to more adequately advocate for their children. And the last I'd like to point to is number 37, uh, and I'll, uh, uh, it uh, specifically uh, uh, speaks to a funding for a substance abuse, excuse me, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, uh, to create stabilization centers uh, that provide walk-in care for individuals with serious mental wellness concerns or substance use disorder. Uh, as uh, I've uh, uh, spent the last 12 years uh, in county government in the state of New York, uh, my county led in the development of the most comprehensive community-based mental wellness program in the country. Uh, centerpiece to that uh, initiative uh, was uh, our one-of-a-kind stabilization center, which I pioneered. Uh, this uh, this uh, center proved uh, effective in reducing emergency department visits, hospitalizations, and even incarceration in my home county. Substantial reduction in both violent crime and incarceration uh, while enhancing uh, mental health and substance use disorder programming. Expanding access to these crisis stabilization centers across the country will help those uh, addressing mental wellness concerns, address uh, the and, and lead to the reduction in incarceration safely, and uh, assist uh, those who are dealing with substance use disorder, uh, perhaps addressing uh, those who might uh, uh, show signs of acting out violently against themselves or others, contemplating suicide, uh, and overall provide uh, assistance to those uh, dealing with mental wellness concerns. I'd ask consideration of all four of these amendments. I think they're common sense and uh, advance uh, both uh, access and support to those with disabilities, of course, uh, those uh, living with mental wellness and substance use disorder, uh, and confront to what is a growing concern uh, of anti-Semitism on college campuses across America. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back, Chair. Thanks, the gentleman. Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Indiana for speak on her amendments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, before I talk about my amendments, if I could, I just want to comment on the Job Corps amendment. Um, I'm disappointed in the cuts to the Job Corps funding and would certainly continue to advocate for, for restoring that funding. Um, I do have a bill this, this uh, session. It's prioritizing funding for evidence-based workforce development programs um, that could address some of the concerns that appropriators might have in, in funding for certain programs just making sure that we're sending those funds to the programs like Job Corps proven, that have been proven to work. Um, also, I'd like to give a comment on uh, Mr. Molinaro's um, amendment on third party advocates. I'm also a sponsor of that amendment and um, support it as well. Um, I kicked off Congress with a priority of mine, which is uh, li uh, literacy improvement. You know, our, our students in the United States have declined uh, in their literacy rates significantly over the last several years. In my first education and workforce hearing, I discussed the need to push the industrial educational complex away from failed balanced literacy approaches to more phonics-based reading instruction to help our students, especially those with dyslexia and other reading disabilities. My son's dyslexic. Um, there are many students across my district and across the country that have this reading disability. In fact, one in five Americans suffers from dyslexia. Uh, we're making progress toward a more phonics-based instruction. We know that students at the, in the top 20% of students will learn how to read no matter how you deliver the material to them. The bottom 20% of students will only learn to read if you deliver it to them in a very specific phonics-based way. And all the students in the middle will benefit most by the methodologies that we use to teach students in the bottom 20%. So I'm proud of the work that we've done, but it really is hard to turn the bureaucratic barge at the state and the federal level. Uh, after COVID-19 uh, and learning losses that followed, it really is more important than ever that we focus on what works. So that's why, Mr. Chairman and my fellow committee members, I put forward two amendments in the hope that committee could make them in order. Amendments number 324 and 325. Uh, Houchin Amendment 324 highlights the importance of a phonics-based curriculum, and Houchin Amendment 325 highlights the importance of literacy education for all results for the nation, which is a program under the ESSA. We must prioritize the instructional methodologies that work and support programs that can help students become better readers. 
It's clear that strong reading opens doors for students to explore math and science fields, and students that don't learn to read, particularly by the third grade, will be negatively impacted their entire educational journey, and this is something we should all be able to work together on. That's why I urge the committee to make in, in order these two amendments, because our students can't wait. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and pending questions, I will yield back the balance of my time. Chair, thanks, gentlelady. The witnesses have all done such an awesome job. I have no questions. I'll go to Mr. McGovern. I'm going to follow your lead for the first time ever. <laughs> Jen Lady from Minnesota. Well, now that he's leaving, you can do that. <laughs> no, I yield back. Jen Lady from Pennsylvania. Just a quick comment. As you've pointed out with respect to so many great programs, whether it's early education, SAMHSA, Job Corps, all of these things are drastically cut, 80% cuts to Title I, which is funding for our poorest schools. There's not a member here whose district won't suffer more than $20 million in cuts. Hundreds of teachers gone. So I think that needs to be part of the mix as we move forward with this legislation. Chair, thanks, the gentlelady. Gentleman from South Carolina. And the gentlelady from New Mexico. Once again, uh, I have no questions. I thank the witnesses for showing, including our members, and discussing how important some of these are for our community at large. Uh, I do think that I don't know if Congress should be involved in the minutiae details of a division director, but I'm glad you have sent it to a, uh, 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 the normal process for clearing. But thank you so much, and thank you for bringing the issues with regards to the COPA as well. Uh, I think that's very important that we not forget uh, our Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, where the, what is it? The sun rises <laughs> on Guam. Gentlelady yields back to, gentlelady from Indiana, Ms. Houch is recognized. I have no questions for myself or any of the panelists. Thank you. So stipulated, the gentleman from New York. I have no questions. Gentleman yields back. Uh, seeing no other questions for this panel, uh, thank you for coming before us today. And this panel is excused. Mr. Chairman, can I ask, uh, request unanimous consent to insert in the record a statement from Ranking Member Thompson in support of his amendment, which would continue the Chemical Facility Anti-Terrorism Standards Program at the Department of Homeland Security? Yes, you may ask for unanimous consent, and without objection, so ordered. Thank you, and the uh, gentlelady from New York is recognized on, to speak on her amendments. Is this thing on? Am I on? There we go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. Good luck to you. You'll be missed. i sorry to hear about your, your change. Um, thank you to Ranking Member McGovern as well. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to testify about my amendment, which would add the text of the Susan Muffley Act to H.R. 5894 of the Labor, Health, Human Services, Education, and Related Agencies Appropriations Act of 2024. As most of you know, in 2009, more than 20,000 Delphi salaried retirees lost the full value of their retirement benefits in the aftermath of the General Motors bailout. As part of its 2009 bankruptcy agreement, the Delphi Corporation, a subsidiary of GM, surrendered its pension obligations to the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. The Obama administration then worked behind closed doors with union leaders to guarantee union workers full pension benefits while slashing the pensions promised to the 20,000 non-unionized salaried staff. After a decade of exhausting every venue, uh, avenue in the judicial system, a Delphi, the Delphi salaried retirees uh, relied on Congress to restore their pension assets. In order to right this egregious wrong, uh, I, along with Congressman Turner, Kildee, Moore, have introduced the bipartisan Susan Muffley Act to fully restore the Delphi salary retirees pension, retirees pension plan assets with lost earnings that they are owed. I want to take a moment to tell the full story of one of my constituents, Judy Folks. Judy's husband, Denny, worked for Delphi 
or Delphi for over 35 years and, was always, it, and it was always important to him to know that Delphi's strong uh, contri pension, pension contribution plan would take care of his wife when he passed away. However, one night a FedEx package was thrown on Judy and Denny's front steps and they were shocked to find out that Denny's pension assets were eviscerated. Denny was already, already struggling with illnesses at the time, but his news sent him into depression. He became suicidal and even remarked to Judy that the only way he could be a good provider to her is to die by April 1st before their coverage was expired. It financially crippled Judy and Denny. They had to make their own laundry soap, buy Christmas presents at garage sales, and his family was stuck trying to find a way to afford his medical bills. They could barely make ends meet. General Motors and, pension, and the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation had no issue fully funding Denny's unionized co-workers' pensions. But because Denny was a salaried non-unionized employee, his pension was slashed. This was completely unjust. The decision stripped Denny of everything he had worked for to provide for his family and his wife. This, uh, J Judy and Denny should not be collateral damage in this situation. These types of injustices have, har and, and have harmed many, and I'm honored to support the Susan Muffley Act and to be a co-lead of this important legislation. I also want to highlight that r six rules committee members have already publicly demonstrated their support for this bill. Chairman Cole, Ranking Member McGovern, Representatives Negus, Scanlon, Ledger Fernandez all voted for this bill in July of 2022, and Representative Langworthy is now a co-sponsor this year. I'm disappointed that this legislation never received a vote in the Senate last Congress, despite our strong bipartisan, bipartisan advocacy and insurances, assurances from the majority leader in the Senate that it would be done. Reversing this injustice would be life-changing for so many of my constituents and all the Delphi salaried retirees across the country whose pensions and benefits were stripped away unfairly. And finally, I want to dispel a common myth about this legislation. This bill is not a bailout. This bill is not a bailout. The Delphi salaried re retirees' pension contributed to the pensions and, and, lived, and they lived up to the contract the pension bill laid out for them. In essence, the federal government under the Obama administration rob from non-unionized employees to give to unionized employees as a backroom deal. The unionized employees received almost 100%, if not 100% of their pension in almost every case. Even President Trump supported fully restoring the Delphi salaried re re salary retirees pension assets. It's time for Congress to right this terrible wrong. I urge you as, as the powerful members of the Rules Committee to deem this amendment in order and help the Delphi salaried retirees restore their full pension benefits. After 14 years of fighting, it would be a travesty if they had to continue waiting and be denied a just result. Before I yield back, I would just like to thank again Representatives Michael Turner, Dan Kildee, and Gwen Moore for co-leading my amendment and for, and for introducing the Susan Muffley Act alongside with me this year and in addition, uh, Rules Committee member uh, Nick Langworthy from New York. It's been an honor to fight alongside all of them to pass this critical legislation, and I will continue to do so until we right this egregious wrong. I want to say special thanks to Rick Straczynski and all of the advocates from the Delphi Salaried Retirees Association for their hard work, tenacity, and continued advocacy on behalf of everyone. Today is just one battle, and we will continue to fight this battle for justice and fairness. With that, I yield back, and I'm happy to take any questions anyone may have. The Chair, thanks, the gentlelady. The Chair, <clears throat> I want to take a moment to just speak about one of the amendments that I've offered, and I have offered several, but uh, this is an amendment actually offered by Dr. Harris, number 155. Um, this amendment would decrease funds from the Office of Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services and increase the Health Resources and Service Administration to Health Workforce Funds. The No Surprises Act, which passed in December of 2020, was written very carefully by the committees of jurisdiction. Unfortunately, the agency has chosen to completely ignore congressional intent as it has implemented this, and now one of the unfortunate offshoots of this is that there is no, even when an independent dispute resolution is decided in favor of the doctor, the insurance company is under no, feels that they're under no obligation to actually pay what, uh, what has been owed. So this amendment 
seeks to correct that. Um, it has taken way too many days for payment disputes to be resolved. And then on top of that, even after they're resolved, oftentimes they are just simply ignored. The secretary has implemented this policy extremely poorly, no serious enforcement. As a result, doctors are leaving the workforce in droves. Because the Secretary of Health and Human Services is furthering the health workforce shortage, this amendment would decrease the office of the secretary and increase the top line of HRSA health workforce accounts. And I will urge that my that Dr. Harris's amendment be made in order. Um, that concludes testimony from the witnesses. Again, awesome job by both of our testifiers. I have no questions. The gentleman from Massachusetts. I thank you. I support your amendment. Do you support mine? Chair, recognize the gentleman from South Carolina. No questions. The gentlelady from Pennsylvania and the lady from Indiana, the gentlelady from New Mexico. Mr. Langworthy from New York. I, I just uh, want to take a moment and salute uh, Congresswoman Tenney for her leadership uh, for the Delphi salaried retirees. We, we uh, share neighboring districts and, and a lot of mutual constituents have been deeply affected by this. Uh, and your leadership uh, on the Ways and Means Committee and, and for those workers is, is really commendable and I look forward to working with you to get this over the finish line. Um. This witness panel is then excused with no further questions. Is there anyone else seeking to testify on H.R. 5894 or the Further Continuing Appropriations and Other Extensions Act? Seeing none, this closes the hearing portion. Without objection, this committee stands in recess.